Good afternoon. My name is Steve Durian with Jefferson County, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. I call to order the June 27th, 2022 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. In this digital format, members and alternates have the uh, ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on the agenda item. Please make sure that your typed name reflects your first and last name and your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can redirect those to our staff in the Q&A box. First, we'll do roll call. And this time, Cam, uh, will you list the attendees? Uh, if for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added for the record. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance right now, I currently see uh, Steve Durian, Art Griffith, Brian Weimer, uh, Bryce Hammerton, Chris Hudson, Deborah Basket, Hillary Simmons, James Eusen, Jan Rao, Jeff Dackenbring, Jessica Furco, Jessica Micklebust, Justin Schmitz, Ken Johnston, Kent Mormon, Mac Callison, Phil Greenwald, Rachel Hattin, Rick Pilgrim, Ron Papsdorf, Sarah Grant, and Walter Wirt. Uh, those are all the members I currently see at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cam. Next, we have a couple of introductions. So, Jacob, you want to take this one? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, we do have a couple uh, routine membership changes on Transportation Advisory Committee. These are not related, actually, to the membership item that we will have um, later on this agenda. These are more routinized members, but I did want to give, or routinized membership updates, I should say. Um, but I did want to um, update the TAC on a couple changes in membership. Um, first is, um, want to say goodbye and thank you um, to David Ulane, who has been our aviation special interest seat member um, for, um, for the last little while. Uh, really appreciated having him on TAC. He has asked to kind of sign off. Um, he, so his seat for now until um, or the Regional Transportation Committee approves it uh, for sure will be uh, filled by his alternate, George Holokoff from Denver International Airport. Um, so that's one change. Um, second change is CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail representative has been Amber Blake, who's the director of DTR. Um, she asked to have her membership changed to Brian Metzger of DTR staff. Um, so again, we thank Amber for her um, participation and contributions and say hello to Brian and welcome him to TAC. Um, and then finally, um, on our um, one of our other special interest seats, um, the TDM, Transportation Demand Management Non-Motorized Seat, um, Carson Priest has been the member. Um, he's appointed Rachel Holtine. Rachel, hopefully I said your last name correctly, um, has his alternate. Carson's actually not able to be here today. He's still the member, um, but Rachel will be representing the seat today. And so we welcome Rachel to TAC as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Okay, next we have public comment. We will now open the meeting for public comment. If you have joined by computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and you will need to mute yourself by pressing star six on the phone. Or sorry, unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak after which we will ask you to wrap up and uh, your line will be muted. So do we have anyone here for public comment? Pam, I don't see anyone with their hand up. Is that what you see as well? Uh, yes, Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands raised at this time. Okay, well, we will close public comment then. Uh, next, we will move on to uh, our May 23rd and June 20, I'm sorry, June 13th, 2022 TAC meeting summaries. Uh, is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about either of these TAC meeting summaries? Please use the raise hand button to indicate that you have question, correction, or would like to speak. It looks like there are no hands. We'll call those uh, meeting minutes final. Uh, and I believe uh, then we move on to our first action item, our only action item on the agenda, which is item number four on the agenda, Transportation Improvement Program Policy Amendments. Josh uh, Schwenk, I believe you are doing this one. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I do have five proposed amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program for you this afternoon. I'll run through each of them here briefly. 
So the first is the, to the I-25 managed lanes project between 120th and E-470. This is in order to refinance an existing private loan on the project into a federal TIFIA loan in order to take advantage of a better interest rate. In order to meet TIFIA requirements, we need to show the amount that is being refinanced within the years of the current TIF. So we are proposing to shift 23,630,000 from the prior year's column into fiscal year 2023. Um, that's not new funding, that's simply moving between years in the TIF. Um, and then also uh, increasing that by an additional $4.8 million, uh, which would be used to purchase additional tolling equipment to be used along the corridor. Next, we have the I-70 and Piccadilly Interchange project. This project was recently awarded $8.5 million in state faster safety funding. So we'd be adding that to the TIF. Next, we have the I-70 Floyd Hill project. Um, this would be to increase the state legislative funding on the project by an additional $6.3 million um, and to add parking at the El Rancho Park and Ride site to the project scope. Next, we have the addition of a new project to the TIP. Um, this would be an award of $34,241,000 total of federal ARPA funds. That's the American Rescue Plan Act COVID-19 relief funding. Um, $22,828,000 is actually shown within the current years of the TIP. The rest would be in future year funding. And this is funding that is dedicated to transit operating assistance within the small urbanized areas in Boulder County. Some additional information on this is provided um, attached to your packet in the form of a few letters from Boulder County, as well as the program of projects showing uh, which transit lines the funding is anticipated to be spent on. And finally, we have another new project proposed to add to the tip. This would be a total of $13,051,000 in federal raise grant uh, funding. Again, 6362000 of that is shown within the current years of the TIP with the remainder in uh, future year funding. And this would go towards improvements to the Washington Street corridor in Denver between 47th and 52nd avenues. So I'd be happy to take any questions on any of those five projects. Um, otherwise, I do have a proposed motion available uh, both in your packet as well as uh, here on your screen. All right, uh, thanks, Josh. I see Rick Pilgrim, you've got your hand up. Yes, Mr. Chair, uh, just uh, want to indicate that my company has a financial interest in the Floyd Hill project, so I will abstain from voting. Thank you, Rick. Deborah Basket? I'll make the motion to move to recommend to the RTC the attached amendments to the 2022-2025 TIP. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Kent Mormon, I think your hand up was next. Yeah, I'll second that motion. Thank you, Kent. Any discussion about the motion? Seeing no hands, uh, we will go ahead and vote. Uh, if you, uh, for all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 For all those opposed, signify by saying no. Uh, the motion passes. Thank you. Let's go ahead then and uh, move to item number five on your agenda, which is an informational briefing on the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan Greenhouse Gas Update and CDOT 10 year plan update. Jacob Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Give me just a second here. <clears throat> Okay, hopefully folks are seeing that in presentation mode. All right, so um, thank you, Jacob Rieger, Dr. Cog staff. Um, I know that we have given you a tremendous amount of information on this item and it really frankly reflects the complexity um, of the work that we've been doing. This really is complicated stuff. Um, I know there's a lot for us to work through today. What I'm gonna suggest, the presentation is actually pretty short and what I'd like to do is just give the presentation, it's just a few slides, let's go through it so that we all have the information and context and then happy to come back and we can have uh, questions and discussion on any particular topic associated with this. 
So first, just to kind of kick us off, this is just kind of a reminder. Um, you all have seen the slide before by general sort of process and overview. Um, again, um, deadline of October 1st from the state GHG rule to have the 2050 RTP revised and adopted to meet the emission reduction requirements that are in the GHG rule. Um, this slide, as you know, conveys sort of our overall kind of big picture process framework that we've been uh, working towards. Um, hopefully, after having talked about this every month for several months, one of the big messages that I want to get through is that it's really going to take a whole collection of strategies. It's not going to be one or two or even three things. It's going to be multiple things, many, many things that get us to the emission reduction targets for each analysis here. Um, and that's reflected in the complexity of the things that we're working on in each step of this flow chart. Um, so just kind of a reminder, um, you know, we've talked a lot about programmatic investments in the plan, the non-project specific things that we've been doing um, in the focus model. That's been, you know, sort of the first part of this overall strategy, this framework that we're building to meet the emission reduction targets. Um, we started to talk about, and we'll talk more today about strategic changes to the 2050 plans project investment mix and to the fiscally constrained plan to try and invest even more dollars in some of these programmatic investments to do more and to do them sooner. Um, to get the GHG benefits of those investments sooner to help us meet the requirements. We've also talked about near-term land use forecast adjustments based on observed residential density increases between 2019 and 2025. Um, the idea that if we observe in the real world that it's developing differently and at higher density than we had um, originally forecast in the forecasts uh, that were part of the adopted 2050 RTP, you know, can we reasonably but transparently uh, reflect that in our work now on the GHG analysis? And then we've also started a conversation and we'll talk more today about several potential mitigation measures um, and doing a mitigation action plan under the GHG rule relating to several topics. Um, again, several mitigation measures that we're considering to help us close the gap to meet the emission reduction targets. Oh, and actually, yep, yeah, I'm not sure why that came out of order, but um, another component as well from the modeling side and the technical side, um, telework rate adjustments um, in the focus travel model reflecting kind of you know, where we're at now and where we think we're going in terms of um, travel behavior. So this table was in the memo. Um, I will first note that this is draft. It changes every time we run the model. Um, so this is still a work in progress, but it's pretty well generally order of magnitude of kind of where we're at um, in terms of meeting the emission reduction targets by analysis year. Uh, remember that according to the GHG rule, uh, we have to meet emission reduction targets for 2025, 2030, 2040, and 2015. Um, so this is showing you kind of the primary three years of where we're at based on our current work. Um, of course, we've been working on all of the analysis years, but we've primarily, not primarily, but we've been putting emphasis on the 2030 analysis year as kind of the first big year um, of which we've been struggling to meet the emission reduction targets um, and trying to do what we can to set up this framework uh, to meet 2030 and then carrying that work forward to 2040 and 2050. Um, in terms of project modifications in the plan, um, and there was a table in one of the attachments in the memo um, to this. First, just to kind of convey the overall strategy again, remember I said it's going to take multiple things. Uh, we've talked about things in the model. We've talked about programmatic investments. We've talked about uh, land use forecast adjustments, which is not quite itself a strategy, but something that, that we're looking at. Uh, we've talked about mitigation measures. So there's all of these things, multiple strategies that it's going to take for us to get there. One of those strategies is, in the spirit of the rule, assessing our fiscally constrained plan, assessing the major project investments, and understanding, you know, is our plan, you know, so to speak, as GHG friendly as it can be? Are there things that we can do in the project investment mix, in the plan, um, to help us meet the requirements of the rule? Um, and so we've talked about the concepts here at previous meetings. We'll get into project details um, today in the conversation, I imagine. Uh, but we've been looking at in the major projects in the plan in table 3.1 in the 2050 RTP, uh, the projects that we map and that we model, um, we've been looking at some strategic surgical modifications to some of the freeway projects um, in the 2050 RTP. And we've been working with CDOT um, on those. Uh, we've been looking at some of the roadway projects in the plan um, to see if there are things we can do on some of the roadway projects to, to sort of refocus the scope of those projects to make them again, you know, complete street safety, multimodal, things that help address what those projects are trying to address, um, but also help us meet the GHG requirements. We've also spent some time talking about the BRT network that we defined in the plan. Uh, recall that we defined a really robust network of about 10 to 12 
um, distinct bus rapid transit corridors throughout the region um, to implement over the 30 years of the plan based on the NAMS work, based on RTD's regional BRT study, uh, based on our own planning. And we've talked about advancing some of those BRT corridors, um, particularly being really aggressive for 2030, seeing if we can advance, you know, find a way to fund to advance and complete some of these corridors sooner so that we can get these projects done sooner and capture the GHG benefits sooner. And then, as I alluded to, also looking from the fiscal constraint, the financial plan side of the 2050 RTP through these other project changes, other things that we can do to free up, um, you know, a significant amount of additional investment, about $900 million um, through 2050 to do even more investment in programmatic non-project specific strategies to really help get us to uh, the emission reduction targets. And can we do more of those things? Can we do them sooner? <clears throat> So this table is, um, was also one of the attachments in the memo. Um, this is a work in progress. We are continuing to refine this um, in conversations with project sponsors and conversations that we'll probably have today. Uh, for example, CDOT has noted some wordsmithing changes they would like on one of their projects. So I do want to take note of that. Um, but I think in concept, this table really presents the major project specific changes that we've been looking at as part of the GHD analysis. We'll come back and talk about specifics, but we wanted you to see kind of everything that we've been talking about across the region um, in terms of the project changes that we've been contemplating and working with project sponsors on. Um, mitigation measures, <clears throat> we've talked about mitigation measures that will be needed to achieve the GHG targets. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, we've done a lot of technical analysis of analyzing the feasibility and applicability of several measures from policy directive 1610. Um, we've talked about the fact that a lot of what's in PD 1610, uh, particularly on the transportation side are things that we can already model. Um, things that are already in the plan, already in the model, things that we've already captured in our technical analysis. So for us, we're looking at things that are more land use oriented, uh, policy oriented, things that are kind of outside our modeling environment, outside of our plan environment, um, but measures and things that we can do, we think we can do as a region to help close the emission reduction gap. So um, again, I'm not gonna read through all these. We'll come back and talk about the specific mitigation measures, but um, it's, I think I counted up, it's, it's eight distinct, I think uh, maybe more than that, maybe we're up to nine uh, sort of distinct mitigation measures and strategies that we're considering uh, because we'll need all of those things we think uh, to meet the emission reduction targets under the rules. So this is a kind of a list of um, showing these and there's a table as one of the attachments to the memo um, that kind of shows you some of the analysis um, associated with the measures and uh, what we think the estimate, the draft estimate of the emission reduction targets associated with the measures. That's in attachment three. And then we also prepared an interactive web map to illustrate um, the geographies that are attached to or associated with um, these proposed mitigation measures that we've been talking about. Um, so here's kind of a screenshot um, of that map. Um, the link was included in the memo. Hopefully most of you got that link to work. Um, when we come back and get into it, um, I can bring up the map and we can kind of walk through it. But we wanted folks to see the geographies. We're looking at some very specific geographies um, across the region associated with the mitigation measures. Um, and then also sort of the federal funds um, implications. We've started to talk about this. Um, as I've told you at previous meetings, um, the consequence of not meeting the emission reduction targets by analysis here within the GHG rule, the consequence of that, the implication is a restriction on federal funds, specifically a restriction on STBG, the Surface Transportation Block Grant, and the CMAC funds administered both by Dr. Cog and by CDOT within the MPO area. Those funds in that scenario would be restricted to only projects allowed by the GHG rule that would reduce GHG emissions. And that would affect project eligibility for Dr. Cog's um, upcoming tip, the 23 to 27 tip, um, calls three and four um, that Todd and Ron have been talking about. Those restrictions would also affect CDOT project funding eligibility, again, within the Dr. Cog MPO area through Dr. Cog's, or excuse me, through CDOT's 10 year plan. We, our understanding of the rule is that some eligible components of restricted projects could potentially advance. A lot of the projects in the plan are multimodal. They do have multiple components. So there is some possibility um, that some components of some projects could advance, um, but other components or other projects would not be allowed to go forward under that scenario. To help you understand that and to illustrate that, attachment four um, to the memo highlights those regionally funded projects. Again, this comes from table 3.1 of the 2050 RTP that would either likely or potentially be restricted in that scenario um, if there are restrictions on funds. 
So that was a lot, but that's kind of the strategic overview of where we're at. So I'm gonna pause there and open it up for questions and conversation, and we can go back to or pull up anything that folks wanna talk about. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Does anyone have any questions or comments for Jacob at this point? Here's that we do not have any hands. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, it looks like I do see a hand raised uh, from a phone number uh, that we weren't able to move over. So in case it is a member or an alternate, uh, I'm going to give them permission to talk uh, and uh, go ahead if you, if you can speak now. Yeah, hi, uh, this is uh, Tom Reich with Castle Rock. Sorry, I have to call in as well as go through the computer here, but this is my uh, phone number. Uh, so I know the when the 2050 RTP was originally approved, it went through an extensive public outreach effort. What kind of public outreach effort are, is, are these changes gonna be going through? Yeah, that's a good question, Tom. So uh, for Tom and everyone, um, anytime that we amend or update the plan, GHD or otherwise, uh, we have our public comment process that we go through um, and we will have started going through it now and we'll continue to go through it um, as part of this process. Um, sort of the core of that is a 30 day public comment period um, that we'll be having, uh, which will culminate in a public hearing. Um, so we will be doing all of that work. Um, we have been socializing a lot of this through, as you all know, um, through your county uh, transportation sub-regional forum meetings, and we will continue to do that. Um, I've mentioned in some of the previous presentations, we've continued to work with our civic advisory group, uh, which is our group of uh, folks who either are or work with underrepresented individuals um, in the region. We've been working with them, meeting with them about monthly through this process. Um, and we'll continue to do that. And as we've typically started to do through our 30-day public comment period, we will also be kind of having some, you know, some meetings and presentations during, um, during those 30 days to interested groups um, to help get the word out and help sort of present the information uh, once we reach that point. So that's kind of in a nutshell, but the point is that all the things that we've always done, we will continue to do through this process. Thank you. All right, Alex Hyde Wright. Thank you, this is Alex Hadright with Boulder County. Um, I had a question on the scenario where we do not adopt a mitigation action plan. So in that scenario, the funds would be restricted in calls three and four, specifically the STBG and DMAC funds. Um, does, Jacob, do you have a sense of what percentage of those funds would be restricted in call three? Would it be all of those funds are limited to only projects that reduce emissions? or only part of those projects or what what magnitude of restriction are we talking about given where the modeling is at right now? Yeah, I guess what I'd say first is, um, again, I think it's attachment four shows you kind of that list and we tried to categorize out um, each of the projects in table 3.1. So our you know air quality regionally significant projects in the plan to give you a sense from a project level, uh, what might happen in a scenario of restriction of funds. I don't know that we've done the math in terms of like percentage of funds or amount of funds. Um, but it, it would be significant, um, and I don't, you know, I don't want to shy away from saying that it, it would have a major impact, um, and that's obviously why we're doing everything we can uh, to find a strategy, a set of strategies, and a framework uh, that would allow us to meet the emission reduction targets. So, if if we don't, when would that math be taking place? Because wouldn't we need to know pretty much by the end of July as we head into calls three and four? Let me think about how to answer that, Alex. Um, I think what I'd say, I'm gonna ask Ron for help with this, but I think we can certainly do this sort of mathematical analysis. That's not tremendously hard to do, and we can do that just to kind of illustrate that. But I think it comes back to, and Ron, please help me with this. It's, it, it's amount of funds, but it's really the project eligibility itself and what those funds can be spent on. So it's, it's not just a, a sort of mathematical restriction of funds. I don't believe it's actually restrictions on project eligibility itself. Is that correct, Ron? Um, yeah, Ron Pabstro for Dr. Cog. So Alex, if I'm understanding the question right, um, so all, all CMAC funds, STBG funds, and most but not all multimodal options funds under Senate Bill 260 and the greenhouse gas rule would be restricted to only being spent on projects determined to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. 
So um, with, unless there was a waiver granted by the sought and granted uh, for a specific project or projects by the Transportation Commission. So that, that restriction essentially would apply to all of the STPG and CMAC funds, not 10 of the 30 million ish that are available. I mean, no, yeah, the, res the, restrict, the restriction applies to all of the STBG and CMAC funds. Okay. There's not, um, a, not a percentage of those funds that are restricted. And then my, okay, that, that's, that's very helpful. Um, and then my second question is, it sounds like part of figuring out which scenario we're gonna be in for call three and four is whether or not the Dr. Cog board adopts a mitigation action plan. When, when are we making that decision and are we assuming that that's the route we're heading down or, or is Dr. Cog looking for direction from TAC or what, what's the decision-making process for determining if we're going to have a mitigation action plan or not? Yeah, that's a good question, Alex. So um, first we are sort of at this point, we've gotten far enough analysis in the analysis to understand that we do need mitigation measures if we're going to meet the emission reduction targets. We are proposing um, the draft mitigation measures that are included in the attachments to this item today. This of course is just an informational item today. We have started to socialize that concept with our board. Um, at their June meeting, we had a conversation about mitigation measures. We will be talking to them again at their board work session on July 6th um, to go through that. Um, Assuming we do a mitigation action plan, part of what our board would need to do, um, well, let me put it this way, assuming we're deploying mitigation measures or including mitigation measures as part of this framework, um, our board would need to adopt a mitigation action plan that would theoretically occur probably at the September meeting or the meeting that the board would adopt the revised 2050 RTP. So I think the point I'm saying is that we've gotten far enough along to say that as staff, we know that we need mitigation measures uh, we're proposing that we do a mitigation action plan. It becomes official when our board decides to take that action to adopt the mitigation action plan as part of the revised 2050 RTP. So you're saying we know that we need to do a mitigation action plan if the goal is to prevent the funds from being restricted in call three. Correct. But it and is, of course, a, up to our board. Yeah, that's a policy. If that's decision. not the goal, then there's, there isn't a need to do the plan. It, it, excuse, excuse me, um, Alex, this is, this is Ron. I, I would say that our objective is to comply with the rule, which is to achieve a demonstration of the greenhouse gas reductions. Um, mm -hmm. our, our goal is not to avoid a restriction on the funds. Our goal is to develop a plan that demonstrates compliance with the greenhouse gas emission reduction levels that are established in, in the rule. Um, so that's our goal. And a, a mitigation action plan and mitigation strategies is uh, a way to do that um, if we if there's not another if there's not another option. Okay. Okay. Next up, Brian Weimer. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I have several questions, so bear with me on this, and we'll kind of step through them. First, um, you show attachment four, which has a list of projects that um, I guess were part of the overall consideration of how you got to attachment two. What was the criteria that you used to get from attachment four to attachment two and some of the decision-making process associated with that? Yeah, so let me clarify the two attachments. Attachment four, and thank you, Josh, for bringing it up on the screen, is a little bit, I mean, this stuff's all interrelated and I don't want to say otherwise, but a little bit separate in the sense that the point of attachment four is just to show in a scenario where there are restrictions on funds, what projects could that affect? And that's the color coding that you're seeing here, either likely to be restricted or potentially to be restricted um, in a scenario where we don't meet the emission reduction targets. That's the point of attachment four. In that sense, as important as it is, it kind of stands on its own. Attachment two is a little bit separate from that. Again, everything's interrelated, so um, don't want to suggest otherwise. But the point of attachment two is to summarize the proposed changes that we're making, regardless of restrictions on funds. So this is attachment two is more about in order to try and, and you know, as Ron just said, to adopt a plan that complies with the rule and all the strategies that's going to undertake all the technical stuff, the modeling, mitigation measures, everything, the component that deals with potential changes 
to our fiscally constrained project mix in the plan, as well as, and I should mention, by the way, as well as the, um, when we started this process, we opened up the plan uh, for our typical sort of cycle amendments or project-based amendments also reflected in this table. So together, these are the proposed changes to um, technically the air quality regionally significant projects um, that are in our adopted 2050 plan. Does that answer your question, Brian? Well, somewhat. I mean, there was a lot of projects on table or attachment four that really could be under attachment two. So how did you choose attachment two projects, I guess? So attachment two is, is proactive through this process based on our analysis of the GHG rule. What changes would we be proposing to the project mix to help us meet the requirements of the rule to help us meet the emission reduction targets. Attachment four is more about in a scenario, attachment two or otherwise, mitigation action plan, attachment two, whatever. If we can't get there, if we can't meet the emission reduction targets, then what would happen to the projects in the plan in terms of restriction on funds? Okay. Um, then I guess my next question is, if there is changing a uh, project from federally funded to locally funded, does that change um, greenhouse gas in your analysis? No, ultimately. So the rule, and this is confusing, so it's a good question. Let me clarify. The, G, the state GHG rule is agnostic of project funding. It doesn't care how a project is funded in the plan. The requirement of the rule is that the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan, everything that's in that plan, the cumulative plan, meets the emission reduction targets for the MPO area, regardless of whether it's a, a CDOT-directed funds project in the plan, Dr. Cog-directed funds, or RTD, or locally funded, or otherwise in the plan. However, in our analysis up to this point, when we have been considering the projects in the fiscally constrained plan, which you're seeing in right now in, in um, uh, in attachment two, we have been focusing on what we call the regionally funded or competitively funded projects in the plan. So those are CDOT directed funds, um, Dr. Cog directed funds. We have not to this point proposed changes to locally funded projects within the 2050 RTP. Okay. And then finally, um, so if we're making these changes to the plan and we're making adjustments there, you know, the plan really has other performance measures and in the action item today, you kind of saw what some of those performance measures were. What are the implications outside of GHG um, and the modifications to the plan on meeting some of these other performance measures that have been established by Dr. Cog? I, and the reason I ask that is I think it's important that the elected officials, the board, those making decisions know what the implications are associated with making these changes. Yeah, it might make um, uh, meet the greenhouse gas initiatives, but it has other consequences. And uh, right or wrong, I think it's it's worth sharing that uh, of what those implications are, what those issues are. So. It's, Dr. Cog, staff planning on sharing that type of analysis with uh, those making decisions? Yeah, it's a good question. So let me give a little bit of context to your question, Brian. So in the universe of sort of performance measures and the things that we do sort of performance-based planning at Dr. Cog, there's several things uh, sort of involved in that sort of internal and external. So let me try and say this really concisely. First thing is that Regardless of all the GHG analysis, anytime we amend or update the plan, we have all of our federal requirements related to fiscal constraint, air quality conformity, and other things, but those two in particular. And we have been doing that analysis as part of this work as well. So for example, for air quality conformity, we still need to demonstrate this plan with these changes as proposed, as you're seeing on the screen, will still meet our motor vehicle emissions budgets for air quality conformity analysis. So that's, that's sort of step one. Internal, well, let me stay with the federal stuff first. Um, there are other performance measures, and this is what you're alluding to, Brian, um, from, uh, from what's now the bipartisan infrastructure law. I still call it the FAST Act performance-based planning, transportation performance measures. We are required in our sort of federally, you know, federal, federal <laughs> federally required uh, planning process to consider those performance measures in the construction and the preparation of our 2050 plan. Those are not project-based performance measures, however, um, and the plan technically, we need to demonstrate how those performance measures are used in our planning process 
Um, but the point of the plan of itself is not to meet an individual performance measure. And it's certainly not for an individual project to meet those performance measures. So, you know, still part of our universe and the planning work, still part of what we're doing. And then internal to Dr. Cog, obviously our MetroVision plan, uh, where of course we have a GHG performance measure as part of MetroVision. Uh, we have things like non-single occupant vehicle travel, uh, mode chair to work. Uh, we have things like VMT per capita, all of those things that we monitor. Again, it's not that the 2050 RTP has to quote unquote, meet all of those requirements per se, or all of those measures, but we certainly do this work in the context of um, all of that. And we, we measure all that when we, and we will be measuring all that when we do kind of the final model runs associated with what will become the revised 2050 RTP um, to see how that changes. So I don't want to speculate, um, but frankly, a lot of the performance measures are related to things that are closely associated or directly associated with greenhouse gas emission reductions. So the changes proposed here for many of those measures ought to be helpful um, if, you know, if there's a change that it's a change that ought to be helpful. So that was a long answer, but. Okay. Thank you. Okay, next up, uh, Frank Bruno. Thanks, Steve. I really appreciate it. Just a quick question, and I know, I know, we, I know this was uh, pointed out to us when we first started reviewing this document and this this work. But I, I sit on the rack um, on the Air Quality Council, and I know we're always, as we're doing this work as well, we're always relating back to the Air Quality Control Commission. So my my question is, and again, uh, forgive me because I know we've covered this is. Our work here that we're talking about uh, with this plan, it's all, I assume, very much in sync with uh, what's coming down through the commission and, and uh, through the RAC as well. Yeah, short answer is yes, Frank, it is. And thank you for that question. So obviously the work through, through the RAC and through others through AQCC of setting the state implementation plan for air quality, uh, which sets our motor vehicle emissions budgets that we need to meet in our 2050 long range planning, you know, 2050 RTP planning process. So we are operating under the current budgets that are set for us. And again, as I said to Brian and, and to all of you, a big part of the work, GHD or otherwise, is again, anytime we amend or update the plan, you know, we have to do that federal air quality conformity analysis, which we're starting to do now to ensure the plan as revised still meets the motor vehicle emissions budgets uh, for air quality for surface transportation. Um, so that's part and parcel of our work, no matter what. As the, um, as the RAC and AQCC and others continue to do the work to set, to prepare new state implementation plans for air quality and to set new motor vehicle emissions budgets in the future, then the 2050 RTP at those times when those budgets are adopted, then those become our new budgets that we need to meet the next time that we amend or update the plan once there's a new budget. That's the relationship between the two. Is that getting at your question, Frank? Yep, that's that perfect. That hits it. Thank you so much. And Matt, Matt Callison, you're, uh, you're up next. Thank you, Steve. I um, uh, appreciate that, Jacob. With the, with the emphasis on, uh, on accelerating some BRT uh, carters identified in the plan, uh, what, is, uh, what has the discussion been to date and what does it need to take place relative to RTD's participation in delivering and managing service in, in those uh, expanded carters? Yeah, thank you, Mac. That's a good question. So I don't want to speak on behalf of RTD, but just a little bit of context here. When we originally adopted the 2050, prepared and adopted the 2050 RTP, our strategy around a regional BRT network was the idea that it was going to take a multi-agency partnership. So just to be clear, just because they're bus rapid transit projects does not make them automatically RTD projects. We knew that particularly in the funding and construction of them, the implementation of them, it was going to take you know, financial contribution, um, from CDOT, from Dr. Cog, you know, it was federal grants. It was going to take a, you know, a constellation of, of funding sources and a strategy to implement those corridors. RTD does have a role, sure, um, particularly on the operating side. Again, I don't want to speak for RTD. I see Bill Saroy coming on, so I'll let him address the operational piece of it. But Mac, to directly answer your question in terms of advancing some of the BRT corridors, that is part of the financial plan fiscal constraint analysis that we've been undertaking and, and coordinating with CDOT and others is the notion that can we, in a 30-year plan, in a fiscally constrained plan, can we sort of move dollars around? Can we make some reasonable transparent assumptions that would allow us to um, advance, you know, again, multi-agency partnership to advance some of these BRT corridors to get them done sooner? Um, Bill, why don't you weigh in on RTD's perspective? 
Sure, thanks, thanks, um, Jacob. Um, Mac, I, I think that our perspective is, and I think we've had a lot of conversations with Dr. Cog on this, um, is that as BRT corridors that are identified in the plan come to fruition, um, that our assumption is if, if that we are not contributing any more operating dollars than we do today. An example, so if we were to put BRT in, federal, in the federal corridor, um, our assumption is that we our operating dollars that we currently um, have today for routes operating in that corridor would be what we would contribute in the future. Um, and it also relates to any rolling stock that we would not, again, producing any additional rolling stock, it'd be the normal replacement of buses that would that we do as part of our state of good repair. So that is where we're at on this, particularly this initial tranche of, of BRT quarters that I think Jacob is, is, is identifying. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, for that. But if, if we're looking at, for instance, on Colfax here, an extension of BRT east of I-225, which is part of the core uh, BRT back to uh, Broadway, Lincoln, or Eric, on, on that um, uh, current bus, as if I understand you correctly, Bill, current bus service and projected any changes in the future uh, going through your your change uh, run boards as such would be the sum of the service provided um, at at this point. Correct. So we're not assuming anything more than we have available in today's quarters, unless, again, the, the only other caveat to that is, as service is identified in the system optimization plan, if our board chooses to adopt it, which they're gonna consider next month, as most of you know, um, that would kind of identify the additional resources that could be implemented if assuming workforce resources are available, but that's another if in this situation. Yeah. Okay, and thank you. Mac, yeah, Mac, I'll just mention specifically on the on the kind of far east Colfax corridor, the extension out to E470. First of all, just to be transparent, a little bit of a work in progress here, but the notion, the reason this is on the table and it's caveated is sort of a potential, it's something we're looking at. Um, but the idea here, just sort of philosophically without getting too much into an individual project is given all of the great work that's happening between Denver and Aurora and CDOT and FTA and other stakeholders on the East Colfax BRT and knowing that, you know, that that's probably the first corridor potentially to come online and all the great work going into that, does it make sense philosophically to just do that extension as well um, so that it all comes together sort of in one, in kind of one tranche, one big project? Don't know, um, but it's something that at least we're just taking a look at. Does, is there some synergy of just doing both of them together or not? So that's why it's on the table. Yeah, and 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 I agree. I mean, there's uh, there's some anchors that are going to be coming online relative to uh, employment and increase in density. So, um, um, uh, very good. Appreciate that. Okay, Chris Hudson. I understand attachment four is a uh, in progress here, but my Two questions related to you talked about a waiver from the Transportation Commission. What do you guys envision that to be, or is this kind of more lots of stuff still in progress? I understand, but is this more set in stone, or will there be amendments? And to build on that, take for example, I see I 70 Floyd Hill is being restricted when I look at this spreadsheet, and they decide, hey, we really got to get. I-70 going, to me, if that goes green or yellow, it has impacts on other projects on this list and things get pushed off the list. Am I reading that correctly? Actually, Chris, let me let me sort of clarify. Um, the color coding on this table, the green is actually not restricted. So I-70 Floyd Hill, we think would not be restricted. Um, it's the red projects that would be restricted the, potentially the yellow projects that would have some potential re restrictions, the green projects would not be restricted, first of all. So Secondly, I, to answer but, your, uh, but sorry, the, go ahead. When I see your spreadsheet here, I see I-70 Floyd Hill eastbound improvements red, $250 million. Is oh, that I'm not correct? No, I'm sorry, I'm misreading the, the table. I was looking at another I-70 project. Um, yes, I'm sorry, you are reading it correctly. My apologies. Okay, so go ahead, I'm sorry. 
No, my, my apologies. You, you are reading the table correctly. Um, so look, the point here, first of all, as Ron said, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, we're trying to revise the plan to meet um, the GHD rule. I mean, that's first and foremost, right? So we're trying not to get to a place of restriction on funds. We're trying to prepare a plan that, that meets the rule because we want to meet the rule. However, knowing that the implication of not meeting the reduction targets is a potential restriction on funds, we wanted to be transparent with you um, and show you what that could look like. So this hasn't been approved by anyone. This is sort of staff's best guess of kind of what that could potentially mean. But we wanted you to see the implications of that. We wanted to get this in front of you. Mechanically, what it would mean is in the GHG rule, there is a provision that if there are restrictions on funds, there's a provision in the GHG rule that says a project sponsor, and that could be Dr. Cog, it could be CDOT, um, could go to the Transportation Commission to seek a waiver on a particular project. Um, and so that is that is an option under the rule. What we're trying to show here is just in the big picture, if we don't meet the if we don't meet the, the rule requirements, how would that affect the plan? How would it affect future tip calls? This is what it could look like. This is worst case, is what you're saying, or is this this best case with all the other 100% electric vehicles, all the different widgets in place? In your opinion, is this is this reality? Let me think about how to answer that, Chris. My so this isn't this isn't a best case or worst case. This is sort of think of it as a bifurcation. We either meet the the rule requirements or we don't. Um, and with everything else that we're presenting today, we are finding that path. We are trying to get there um, in terms of meeting the rule. I think we're, you know, we're getting closer, hopefully by the day, to meeting the rule. So this isn't a best case or worst case scenario. What you're seeing on the screen right now is that we either meet the rule or we don't. If we don't meet the rule, this is what happens from a global. This is what could happen from a global perspective. So there aren't degrees of something here. This is just it is or it isn't. Does that make sense? It does, but my my question to ask is, how close are you to meeting the rule, or is it unattainable? So I'll give my characterization, and I'll invite Ron, Robert, or others to sort of chime in if you disagree. As I said, we you know so in the rule, remember we have four analysis years that we need to meet the emission reduction targets for 2025, 2030, 40, and 50. We've been working on all of those, but as I said earlier, we've been kind of focusing on 2030 as sort of that first big analysis year that we've been working to try and meet the rule for. Based on everything that's in this item and everything that we presented to you today, mitigation measures, everything else, we think that we're, I would say razor thin close. I think we're on the razor's edge of being able to meet the 2030 emission reduction target. We are carrying that work forward to 2040 and 2050 and doing those analyses right now to see if we do all of these good things for 2030, everything I've talked about, the project stuff, the mitigation measures, everything, programmatic investments, like I said, I think we're on the razor's edge for 2030. We're carrying that forward right now to 2040 and 2050, and we're determining how close we are for those two analysis years. Thank you. Okay, next, Art Griffith. Thanks. Um, so the attachment to, don't go there, um, <laughs> that seems like that seems to be headed where i get really confused is this attachment for i mean potentially restricted projects so you know you're on the, the list here um and i don't know what that means so when we talk about in terms of being transparent about attachment four i'm totally lost because it seems like what I'm hearing, Jacob, is that we're close on attachment two as meeting the objective, but here's, here's another list of strategies. So, so before you answer that, I also would like to, before I forget, is like this restricted and waiver thing seems way too subjective. I, I don't see how <laughs> we we deal with that if we end up going to attachment four. So my first question is, is kind of along the lines of Chris's, what is attachment four? I kind of get attachment two, but I'm like, if we're kind of like promoting that, hey, this is what it's gonna look like attachment two and attachment four is kind of a what if, that's pretty great for me to try to explain to elected officials. 
Yeah, I see Ron has his hand raised and I'm guessing he wants to respond. So I'll defer to Ron. Um, yeah, hi everybody. This is this is really helpful. Um, I think Jacob has Jacob's attempted to cover me on this one. Uh, I'll, I'll take the blame for this list and apologize for the confusion it's causing. We were, um, I was trying to just communicate to the group that there are projects in our currently adopted RTP that if we cannot demonstrate compliance with the greenhouse gas reduction levels through the changes we're proposing to the plan and combined with a set of mitigation measures and a mitigation action plan that these projects sort of in red um, would, would likely not be eligible to be funded with CMAC SDB or SDBG funds or multimodal options funds uh, for that matter, unless they, uh, unless they reduced greenhouse gas emissions. And I think based on sort of the rule, the red projects in our estimation would be ones that the folks that would have to make that determination at CDOT and at CDPHE would say they don't reduce greenhouse gas emissions and therefore they would not be eligible for funding with those restricted funding sources without a waiver from the Transportation Commission. And the, and the waiver structure is, as, as Art said, um, a, little, a little subjective, the way the rule's written and no guarantee and very likely, at least in my personal estimation, it would not would not grant waivers for every project on this list, right? So maybe maybe a few, yes, might be might get waivers and be able to proceed, but many probably not. Um, and so the the idea here, th this list means nothing other than just an illustration that not achieving the reduction um, levels could have a very significant impact on the projects that we all have planned on implementing to address. Uh, to Brian's earlier point, many different um, objectives and outcomes for the transportation system um, for the region. And so that, that's all this is. It's just, it's just, an, it's just an illustration. It, me, it doesn't, it's no, it's not a determination. It's not a prediction. It's uh, an attempt to show the potential impacts of not being able to achieve the reduction levels. But as Jacob said, we're working towards through multiple steps, um, achieving and demonstrating compliance with those reduction levels so as to avoid any uh, restriction on those funds so that the bulk of the plan can be implemented because we do have lots of objectives that we're trying to balance and achieve for the region. And Ron, this is Art again. Um, so like uh, the right side of the column, um, wasn't sure where, operations, traffic operations comes in. And, you know, a lot of times traffic operation reduces VHT, but we've kind of all jumped in with three feet into VMT, mm -hmm. but, you know, there's driver expectation and there's what you have like narrowing down, you know, of, of, a, of a facility that's maybe four lines on each side. I was thinking of gun club or county line road. <clears throat> and it's kind of a safety and traffic operations and kind of like uh, related to congestion, reducing VHT. So I, I wasn't sure, you know, where this goes from here, but the project elements might need to be expanded for operations and yeah. some of those ideas. Art, Art and everybody, the, look, the list doesn't go anywhere. The, the, this, is, this is just, it's, it's just one, you know, one interpretation, I think, an educated interpretation. And I, and look, there's, people can discuss and debate sort of the relative merits of those operational improvements. I think the projects in red here are largely, if not exclusively, um, general purpose or managed lane vehicle capacity improvements, additional vehicle capacity on pretty major corridors. And um, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of those projects might also have sort of operational improvements associated with them and other improvement types, but the core of those projects is largely um, pretty significant vehicle capacity expansion. And I think under the letter of the rule and the application of the rule, I think it's a fair, fair um, estimate to say that they would likely be 
the use of those CDB, those restricted funds, STBG funds, CMAC funds, multimodal options funds would be restricted on those projects absent a waiver, a specific waiver from the Transportation Commission. And yes, some of, some of the projects in red might be yellow, some of them might be green. Uh, it's not, this is not meant to be a precise determination. It's not an official determination. We're trying to give some indication of what the impacts may be. Thanks, Ron, that was very helpful. <clears throat> I think next we have Brian Weimer. Yeah, thank you. Um, and it really deals with the waiver concept that's been discussed here. You know, we've been looking at a, really the plan as a whole and meeting greenhouse gases, but it sounds like if we get into a waiver situation for a project that the individual project will be evaluated. And if that's the case, um, can we use whatever modeling tool that we have to show that we're improving greenhouse gases? Not very well, Brian. And look, and, and look I think, again, I, I can't predict what the commission would do, um, but I, I think it's, it's a challenge to envision a future where um, there would be a waiver requested, let alone granted for every project on this list. Um, and, and, and the only reason I say that is we've looked at that um, with a modeling tool, a simu traffic simulation tool, and shown that we can improve greenhouse gases with addition of lanes, however we want to call it, capacity or operational. And so that's why I asked that question. Yeah. And, and Mr. Chair, I think Rebecca White wants to weigh in on this. Oh, sure. Thanks, thanks, Jacob. Rebecca White at CDOT. You know, I, I, I know there are a lot of questions and, and understandably so about what a waiver process would involve. You know, we've uh, not gone through a significant effort yet to script that out. Um, I think we'll, we'll, we're going to have to see how the summer unfolds as everyone tries to meet the standard, but certainly we will develop more guidance around that and how that might be determined on a project by project basis. So I, you know, I don't want to get too much into speculation, but that is the sort of circumstances where should an MPO or CDOT find themselves in a funding restriction, but really need to move forward with an important project for safety reasons or, or other issues. That's why we developed the waiver process. Um, and we've been pretty uh, nose down and trying to get the other pieces of this rule developed. And that's probably what we'll turn to next. So that's all to say, Brian, I really good questions and, and art. Um, I just don't have a lot of detail to offer that on, on my side either yet. Hey, next up is Phil, Phil Greenwald. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Phil Greenwald from the City of Longmont. I just wanted to ask two questions. One is, I'm assuming that if we take our project and pull out the multimodal aspects and move those forward and pull out maybe some of the lane widening and things that do affect the GHTDS directly. And, and you know, uh, I guess one of my projects is specifically looking at kind of Two, two elements, the widening and the, and the multimodal improvements. So I'd really hope that we can get those multimodal move, improvements moving forward. So that's my first question. I just wanna make sure that we can break these projects up into other elements. My second question is just some of the gray ones, I'm a little confused about where they sit, if they're just far enough along that they can't be stopped or, um, it appears that some of them have the same timing as others, but um, not sure why they're listed in gray and not in red for um, widening projects. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Phil. So finally got an easy question, the easiest question of the day to answer. Let me start with the gray projects. So what Ron did in putting this table together was to take our existing table 3.1 of the 2050 RTP as adopted um, last April, 2021. We have a federal requirement in the sort of preparation and adoption of a regional transportation plan from a fiscal constraint analysis and from an air quality conformity perspective to include in the plan projects that are well underway. If they're not yet open to traffic or open to revenue service, 
if it's a transit project, but say they're under construction, they're about to start construction, wherever the case may be. So those great projects are just simply those projects. They're projects that we needed to capture in the plan. They're still, they're still ongoing under construction. They're not quite done, um, but they're so far along that for purposes of the plan, they're sort of like an you know, existing plus committed type of scenario. They're, they're spoken for, they are what they are, they're on their way. And so they're not subject to they're not subject to um, the parameters of the rule that we've been talking about in terms of getting a waiver. They're simply on this table because we wanted to reflect all of the projects, this, the potential status of all the projects in table 3.1. So Phil, does that answer um, that part of your question? Yes, thank you very much. Okay. Um, the first part of your question, I had an answer, I'm so sorry. Just, from, oh, the, uh, the project. I'm just wondering if we can pull a project. Yeah. So again, I'm not gonna speak for CDOT or for the commission, but I think under the rule potentially, and as Rebecca just said, they're, they're starting to define kind of a specific waiver process, but in the rule potentially that's the idea that if you've got a complex project, a multimodal projects, that there are certain elements that are multimodal, say you've got a roadway widening, but it has a bike path, let's say, maybe the bike path can go forward, but the roadway widening wouldn't in a scenario where there's restriction on funds. So. I don't want to get into project specific scenarios and I don't want to issue blanket statements, but I think the idea from the rule is yes, the potential that in a project like that where you've got several components and some of them are multimodal and specifically, you know, dem you know demonstrate GHG compliance, those elements could theoretically move forward, even if another component, say a widening of, of, a, of a roadway project would be restricted under, um, under a restriction of funds scenario. Great, thank you, Jacob. All right, thank you. Uh, next up is George uh, Halakov. Yes, hi, thank you. Uh, my question is actually related to two uh, Pena Boulevard projects on this list in attachment four. I think they're both shown as red. And I would just like to understand a little bit um, what, I mean, you know, this is not a, a pure widening of Peña Boulevard from two to three lanes. Um, it's actually adding a managed lane in each direction. Um, so why, why is it not, for example, shown as yellow? Um, when I look at other projects that are pure red, um, they're just pure widening, right? And the second question I have, we do also have considerations for bike pad uh, provision that can run parallel to that Pena Boulevard. So why is it not getting an X in the second column to the of these kind of <clears throat> columns with a white background and and just axes? Yep. Thank you, George. So um, so again, understood. This is this is conceptual. Um, this is sort of staff's, you know, educated guess interpretation. This is not definitive. Um, but the idea of the Pena being on here is, yes, we understand that that project and many of these projects are multimodal. They have multiple components. You know, we're building more complex projects in this region. Um, the plan tries to recognize that. In the case of the Pena project, though, the thrust of it is a managed lane project, even though it does it may include some of those other elements, which is great. And again, not a judgment of projects here, but the notion that under the rule, staff's interpretation would be that if there's a restriction on funds, managed lane projects, you know, could be restricted. And that's why it's showing in red. Again, not a definitive interpretation. I think, let me just come back to Ron's ultimate point that we've told you for months that, you know, we have this rule, we have the requirements of the rule, we're trying to do all these things, we're trying to get to this point. And what we wanted to help answer for you today is, okay, why? What's the implication? Why are we doing all this? Why does it matter? It matters because if we don't meet the rule and we do have a restriction on funds, we wanted to at least give you a snapshot of potentially what it could look like. So again, we don't want you all to overinterpret this table, but we wanted to be transparent with you and just show you that, hey, if we don't meet the requirements of the rule, it will affect the tip calls. It will affect CDOT project eligibility within the Dr. Cog NPO area. Here is one scenario of what, here's one sort of interpretation uh, from staff of what that could look like. That's all this is meant to be. Thank you. All right, next we have uh, Rachel uh, Halton. Great, thank you. Uh, it, to, to Phil's comment about separating out elements of a project that might be a road expansion that also has some multimodal investments like a side path or widened sidewalks, 
is it possible as part of the RTP update that um, those projects could actually get separated out within the RTP as two different projects to help uh, help reach the goal on greenhouse gas reductions? Yeah, I, so I'm gonna suggest, it's a good question, Rachel, but here's, here's what I'm gonna suggest that in, our approach to our 2050 plan, even before the rule, but particularly with the rule, is the idea that, as I just said to, to George, you know, we are building complex multimodal projects in this region. It's part and parcel of what we're doing. For those of you that participated, now it's been about a year and a half when we were doing candidate project submittals, you know, the whole notion was that even roadway projects were intended to be as multimodal as possible. Now we've done a regional complete streets toolkit. Um, our, act, our, um, our active transportation plan, our regional vision zero plan. The whole notion is that every project that we find, every project that we implement in this region should to the maximum extent possible with its locally appropriate context be multimodal. So while I get your point, Rachel, it does make me nervous to start separating those elements out because our entire, our entire perspective, our entire argument in our planning process has been that these are integrated multimodal projects. And when we start describing them separately, pulling them out separately, that makes me really nervous. I think your point is, okay, under the rule, if there's a restriction on funds and we're trying to get some projects done, can we articulate elements of particular projects to be able to move forward? My suggestion is, first of all, we're doing everything we can to avoid that, as we've said throughout this meeting. But if and when we ever get to that point, then I think we can work with project sponsors and with CDOT to understand if there's a particular project for which we're trying to seek a project waiver with the Transportation Commission that we can work together to understand what elements of that project we're trying to have move forward. Great, thank you. The next up is Justin Smith. Yeah, thanks Jacob for all this. Um, I just had one clarification question, I guess. Um, so obviously in table one, right, you guys have done all this, where well, I'm reading it, right, we made about 80% of the reduction and we still have about 20 to go. Does that include every, all the projects that were amended in attachment two, you know, all those changes, is that included in that analysis or is that something yes. that still has to be factored in? No, it is included. It is included in the It is included and that's part of our point. It includes everything. Um, sorry, Josh or Cam, if you could scroll down to, um, yeah, sorry, it's, it's the next attachment <clears throat> that Justin's referring to. Yeah, I was just trying to clarify that all those are included in and, and we're still yeah. on there even with all of those adjustments, right? Yeah, and actually, um, sorry, Cam and Josh, if you could let me screen share, please. Thank you. Give me just a second. Let me bring the presentation back up. So Justin, I think you were asking about this table. Correct. So at least how so, I read that, right? We're about, well, 81%, I guess, down. But. Give or take, yeah. Um, again, this is draft. It changes every time we run the sure. model, but yeah. So yes, just to be clear to answer Justin's question, this includes everything except the mitigation measures. So all the project-specific stuff, the telework, the programmatic investments that we've already incorporated within the model, all the stuff that we've been talking about, this includes everything up to the point of mitigation measures. And that's why the mitigation measures have become so important because depending on the analysis here, yeah, we're trying to close a 10 to 20% gap, even with all that other work. And that's why I go back to what I said at the beginning, it's gonna take a framework of multiple things to get us there. It's not just a couple things. Thanks. And Matt Callison. Thank you, Steve. A um, couple questions, Jacob. Uh, greenhouse gas, it's carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide, right? For on the mobile side. Yes, I believe that's correct. If you're asking me to confirm that. Yes, yes, I am, please. So given that, um, uh, following up to that on attachment two, where there is a cadre of projects listed in the uh, current RTP and, and proposed change in description and components of those, we're really looking at reducing transportation that's reliant on fossil fuels, gas and diesel burning. So that gets to reducing VMT uh, on those trips using those conventional energy sources on that. So help us explain and understand 
on managed lanes. And, and, and we get the, uh, the NOx and, or the uh, uh, VOCs and carbon monoxide on reducing congestion, bottlenecks, hotspots, and whatnot. But how are managed lanes? What, your, what is the response on managed lanes reducing carbon dioxide? So, Mac, I think if I understand your question, let me start an answer and invite other staff to help me. First, just to be clear, regardless of the particular criteria pollutant source, we're not, first of all, we're not doing a project specific analysis. As we've said, it's the plan as a whole. Um, we also know that individual things by themselves, whether it's an individual project or an individual strategy is not going to get us there. So again, we're, we're sort of building this framework as we've talked about. It's multiple project changes, it's multiple strategies, it's multiple things that get us there. So Mac, if you're asking about a particular pollutant for a particular project type, I guess, can you clarify a little bit? Because that's, that's where I'm getting a little bit puzzled. If you're asking about a, a cause and effect, that's not quite the way the analysis is structured, but I may be misinterpreting your question. Yeah, well, I, I, I'm, I'm really asking uh, if greenhouse gas reduction, carbon dioxide, reducing carbon dioxide uh, emission loads, uh, I would understand if the, if the rationale for managed lanes, you have robust and increased transit, uh, and that transit is, is non-fossil fuel uh, uh, use on, on the energy. Uh, to power those vehicles on that. So I'm, I'm just trying to understand where we have a lot of managed lanes, they're good, uh, but how does that comport with such a, a robust reduction that the greenhouse gas rule requires on the CO2 side of things? Region-wide, all, all projects uh, bundled in into an, a reconfigured RTP. Yeah, I, I think I understand your question, Mac. Again, let me start an answer and invite um, other staff to help me out. I think, so first of all, I think if you're asking about managed lanes, part of an overall strategy, right? There's a lot of things in the plan, a lot of you know, transit, multimodal safety, et cetera. Managed lanes is part of that overall big picture strategy. Um, I don't wanna get into philosophical debates about managed lanes versus general purpose lanes, but you know, look, managed lanes, I think it's safe to say, you know, encourages, it encourages carpooling, right? And we have requirements around, um, CDOT has requirements around HOV use and managed lanes. Um, those lanes can be like US 36, sort of dual sort of transit lanes as well. So managed lanes is part of that overall strategy in this region to help us do the things that we think we need to do to get there. Again, it's one of, you know, several things, but um, managed lanes as opposed to say general purpose lanes or as opposed to individual things, I think is part of that strategy. So I, I hope that's part of your answer, but Ron, Robert, and anyone else, if you want to chime in, please, please do. I can pop on here. This is Robert Spots with Dr. Cog. Um, Mac, it's a, it's a good question. Um, first, first of all, we, we are <clears throat> measuring um, greenhouse gas effects in what we call CO2E. It's equivalent, so it includes, I think methane comes from vehicles a little bit. Um, but anyway, we're, we're taking into account all um, greenhouse gas emissions that come from mobile vehicles. Um, I think a big part of this is these are projects that have been selected because they're, they're potential agreement on removing them from the plan. And I'd say that even more so than the effect on total GHG from removing them, it's repurposing those funds to projects like BRTs that has a larger effect. So may, maybe the managed lanes wouldn't have the largest effect on greenhouse gas as an increase or decrease for that matter. But we think repurposing those large um, fund, large amount of funds into other projects could significantly decrease greenhouse gas. And I think that's a big theory here. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, that helps Robert, appreciate that. Thank you, Jacob, as well. Hey, Ted Mormon. Uh, um, just uh, this question, um, it's really maybe just a refresh. When you assumed, um, you know, the conversion of, to electric vehicles, were you using Colorado Energy Office projections or some other projection in your model? Uh, just asking the question, 
because obviously it won't happen overnight, but it's just wondering how, what, what projection you were using a national standard Colorado, what Colorado energy office set as a goal or some other group. I'm going to ask Robert to answer that question. Sure. So, so, you know, you know this, this rule is very, very independent of, of um, the vehicle, vehicle mix on the road. road. That's, that's why if you look at the table, table you know, our, the total THC emissions, emissions are going to decrease dramatically by the time we're in 2050. And according, according to so as our reduction in wire. wire. So, so the raw raw reduction decreases significantly. It's based on the about 10% or 10% um, um, from, from whatever, whatever that being baseline level was. Irrespective of the vehicles. In terms of what they did, that is all in hand on. I'm having a hard time hearing you, Robert. Um, you're you're right, echoing. You're, you're uh, looks like you might have some technical difficulty with your mic. Oh, that's that's dark, dark, dark dark equipment. equipment. This dark theater effect. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I thought the modulator was on. Perhaps you could uh, put the answer in the chat. Yeah. Do we have any other questions? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, this is Cam Kennedy. Uh, I saw that Brian Weimer uh, put a question in the chat. Uh, Brian, I wasn't sure if you wanted to ask or I could read it if you'd like. Um, uh, Jacob, Brian was asking about the deadline for feedback uh, concur concurrence from Testing local- Testing right now, does that sound a little better? Oh yeah, much better. Yeah. Yeah, actually, so let's deal with um, let's deal with Brian's chat question, and then we'll come back to to Robert yeah. if that's okay, Mr. Chair. That's, a, that's good, good idea. Yeah. So, so sorry, Kim. Go ahead. Go ahead yeah. Cam. So he was asking, what is the deadline for feedback concurrence from local agencies impacted on the changes proposed for attachment two? So while we haven't set a formal deadline, um, honestly, sort of ASAP, we really need it as soon as possible because these changes we will reflect in what will become the final official sort of conformity and GHT model runs for, uh, for this work. And we need to get to that pretty quickly. So um, Robert, I'd, maybe I'd lean on, on you for that too, but I think we, we need it kind of as quickly as, um, as you can get back to us. Should we go back to uh, Robert's uh, answer that we didn't quite get a full hearing on? Can you hear me now? Yes, you sound yes. good. Okay, sorry about that. I, I blame Dr. Cog equipment. Uh, so in terms of electric vehicles, it, it is based on the state's um, kind of aggressive estimates about EV adoption. Their goal is 940,000 passenger EVs by 2030 um, and getting towards 95 to 99% uh, passenger EVs by 2050. So those are all handled on the emission modeling side and don't um, really come into play for this rule. Mike, this can't, um, I don't understand why it would not come into play for this rule if what the goal is, is to reduce greenhouse gases and motor vehicles that give off, um, that use traditional fuel, give off greenhouse gases where electric vehicles don't. Could you expound but, on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, Ken, you're right. It's, it's by far and away the most effective strategy at reducing greenhouse gases we have in our toolbox. But um, the way this rule is set up is that the part we're dealing with and talking about today is a greenhouse gas transportation planning rule. So I think the energy office is really in charge of basically the, the fleet side of things, electrification over there. And it's almost like we're dealing with a different sector here in planning. So, you know, they're doing a huge lift over there on that side and that sector for the vehicle side. This is Dr. Cog and transportation and land use planning's contribution to also reducing greenhouse gases. So Robert, is it is it fair to say going back to Senate Bill 260 and the state emission reduction roadmap, I think it was called that it's accounted for in the overall roadmap, but it it's not part of this particular GHG planning rule. Yep. All right, looks like Art Griffith, you're up next. Yeah, um, question, um, how does um, the projects that are eligible um, by FHWA and CRF, I don't know, maybe 23 or something. Um, there's a list of projects, bridges, reconstruction. How does that, with those federal funds, fall under um, 
the restrictions in, imposed by the state. I, I just want to be able to answer that question if that comes up to elected officials. So I'll start an answer and maybe defer to CDOT to supplement, but, uh, well, actually, no, this, this is CDOT's purview. Would someone from CDOT be willing to just answer directly? Sure, this is Rebecca, you want me to just chime in? Yes, please, thank you. Okay. Uh, good question. I, Ryan, are you talking about our sort of basic asset investments that we do for poor bridges and poor pavement across the state? Yeah, but I mean, also, this is art, actually. Art, but, sorry. Um, um, but it would be like, you know, we're, we're eligible for applying for bridge replacement money and reconstruction projects are eligible as well. And so I was just wondering um, how those fall if um, related to um, this, uh, if we have to implement mitigation money and uh, all of it needs to go to... Uh, greenhouse gas and bridge replacement project or a uh, reconstruction pavement project may not fit. So those are two examples, but it would be for any of the, any of the types of projects that are eligible for federal funding. Sure, so if, if we're talking, um, you know, pure asset investments, those investment decisions are made completely separate for the large part for CDOT from our 10 year plan. So the focus of this standard for both Dr. Cog and CDOT are just those projects um, in the RTB or in CDOT's 10-year plan. Uh, so any asset investments that fall outside of those documents are not subject at all to this standard. So those would completely proceed as they always have and, and based on the condition of the asset and the amount of money we have available. And that's true both for state asset dollars and federal. Did okay, that answer thanks. it? Okay. It sure didn't. It sure didn't. In on behalf no. of CDOT's funding, I wasn't sure how that would trickle down for our eligible projects for those those types of projects through Dr. Cox. Okay, I couldn't. That, hear that might be a hear. handoff to Ron. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, sorry, Art. This is Ron. I, can you say that again? I wasn't. I didn't quite track on. The follow so, um, you know, list of eligible types of project for federal um, funding includes, for example, bridge replacements and sure. also um, reconstruction projects. Um, mm -hmm. Would those types of projects uh, be eligible if they shifted as part of a funding strategy? I mean, they, they really don't. They're not pro greenhouse gas mitigation or con greenhouse gas mitigation. One could argue if you had to close a bridge right. and the detour out of way was, you know, like when they closed I-70 for Glenwood Canyon, that'd be a lot of bad greenhouse gas but everybody had to go over Independence Pass or through Steamboat or something. Um, yeah. But aren't, are, aren't those projects eligible, Ron? I, um, it's, I, I don't know. I'm gonna, I'm gonna quote from the rule as it was adopted, okay? So this is under the compliance section of the rule. If the commission determines, um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna um, kind of shorten this a bit, but if the commission determines that the requirements of the rule haven't been met, in other words, haven't achieved the reduction levels, the commission shall restrict the use of funds pursuant to rule 8.02.6.4, that's, the SDBG funds and the CMAC funds and multimodal options funds, as well as the 10 year plan funds, uh, uh, CDOT's funds, um, to projects and approved greenhouse gas mitigation measures that reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, the way I read those words is that unless the project reduces greenhouse gas emissions, then those restricted funds can't be used on that project. So uh, if, a, if a, you know, a, so a bridge replacement, a replacement in kind probably doesn't reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So without a waiver, you probably couldn't use those restricted funds on that project. I think that would probably be a fairly easy, like, like a safety project, similar to what Rebecca was saying, 
those would probably be fairly easy waiver requests. It's it's the waiver requests for the projects that we made a uh, an attempt at sort of illustrating in that attachment for the that add vehicle capacity where you're actually improving the system that probably are are more challenging. And I see Rebecca uh, is going to provide a more eloquent and better answer than I just did. I don't know that I that I am. I mean, there was a a distinction um, art for the CDOT portions of the state that the, the focus would be on regionally significant projects. And for, for the way we look at regionally significant, those are projects that really change the way traffic moves. Um, however, as I'm looking at the, the part that Ron just read, I, we did not single out regionally significant projects. So I think um, Ron's interpretation, if you have those types of, if we're in a funding restriction, which I think as you all have heard from Dr. Cog today, they're working very hard to not get to that point. If there was a funding restriction, um, it would apply to all projects that receive those STBG and CMAC dollars, regardless if they're regionally significant. Thanks, Rebecca and Ron. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't believe we have any other hands up. Uh, Jacob, do you want to continue or wrap this up, or uh, do you have more on this item? Yeah, I don't have any more. If there's no other questions, uh, first, I just want to thank everyone for your really good questions and comments. This is exactly the kind of conversation we wanted to have um, on this item, so thank you for your input. Um, we will continue forward. Um, obviously, a lot of things in play all at once, as you can see, um, but this has really helped us today, so we appreciate the, um, the extended conversation on this, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Hey, Jacob. Our next item up is the Safe Streets Roads for All Grant Program Overview. And Jacob, I believe you're gonna do this one as well. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I am not Emily Kleinfelter and I'm not gonna do as good a job as she would have, but um, wanted to walk you through this item. Give me just a second. Okay, hopefully folks are seeing that in presentation mode. Um, so yeah, so you all have heard, I think, of the Safe Streets and Roads for All uh, grant program. It's a huge opportunity under the bipartisan infrastructure law. It's a new, it's a new grant program. Um, so folks have started to talk about it. We wanted to kind of get you oriented from what we know so far. And we wanted to kind of start a regional conversation around um, kind of a regional strategy to, uh, for applying for this grant. So um, let's dig into it. <clears throat> So first of all, as I said, um, this comes from the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, this is a discretionary grant program that the BIL um, established with $5 billion in appropriated funds over the next five years. Um, so they'll be doing these sort of grant calls, these NOFOs and notice of funding opportunities um, each year for the next five years. Up to a billion dollars is available in this first sort of fiscal year 2022. <clears throat> Um, and as noted on the slide here, of course, this is um, closely related to and a big implementation piece of USDOT's um, National Roadway Safety Strategy, um, the safe system approach that the federal government is implementing, which is essentially, frankly, in my interpretation, um, a Vision Zero strategy just by a different name, um, but a, a really strong emphasis at the federal level on, um, on road safety, uh, mobility safety. Um, so just sort of a, you know, there's a lot associated with this program. The NOFO has been out for several weeks. Hopefully some folks have had a chance to look at it. So, you know, attempting to summarize, I think what was an 80 page document um, is hard, but we'll try and give you some highlights. Um, first eligible recipients under the Safe Streets and Roads for All, um, metropolitan planning organizations like Dr. Cog, um, political subdivisions of a state. So cities, towns, counties, special districts um, are eligible. Um, a transit district, um, if it was created under state law, um, is also eligible. Uh, federally recognized tribal governments are eligible and multi-jurisdictional groups um, comprised of the entities you know, that, I've, that I've mentioned here, um, eligible entities are also eligible. Um, not to sort of pick on CDOT, but just you know, from the grant, uh, from the NOFO, um, state DOT, so not just CDOT, but state DOTs are not eligible um, applicants under this program. They can be partners as part of a coalition, um, but they cannot be direct applicants. 
Um, so speaking of sort of partnerships, um, the, um, the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, the grant program does encourage joint applicants. Um, uh, again, they need to each be independently eligible entities. So the ones that listed on the previous slide and they're each a party to the grant. Um, you can also have partners. So this is where, you know, an entity like CDOT would come in. Um, if we have a coalition and we're very interested in doing that, we want to talk about that today. Uh, but if we have a coalition applying for an SS4A grant, uh, we can have partners, which can, can include additional non-eligible entities. Uh, they're not a party to the grant. Um, if an eligible applicant is a partner on an application and not a joint applicant, being a partner on that application does not count as the one application for an eligible applicant. So that's a little bit confusing. Uh, there's been some Q&A on this. We're trying to figure out, and I think everyone is trying to figure out um, if you if you apply independently for, for something, because there's a couple ways you can apply under this grant program, can you do that? And can you also be um, part of a coalition or part of a partnership? Let's talk about the funding overview. As I said, $5 billion over the five years, so a billion um, kind of in this first call. Um, there are two types of grants that I'll get into, two types of activities you can apply for under this grant that I'll get into in a moment, um, but they're known as action plans or um, implementation grants. Um, this shows you kind of the breakdown um, of sort of a single applicant versus a, a MPO or joint application. Um, there, are not, there are not sort of technically set minimums and maximums, um, but there are kind of expected sizes for grant amounts. Um, applicants, as it says, can request more or less funding. Um, in terms of cost sharing, um, sort of the typical 80% federal, 20% local in-kind contributions are allowed. Uh, but as noted here, not more than 15% of the funds can be awarded to projects in a single state in a given fiscal year. So they will sort of take a national look at the funding distribution of the grant awards that USDOT is going to make under this grant program. Um, and there are not set asides for rural areas or other grantee categories. Um, so I said there's a couple different grant types, so let's, let's talk about this a little bit. They're known as action plans or implementation grants. Action plan is about planning um, for, for safety and for Vision Zero. So developing or completing a comprehensive safety action plan, or if you've done that, um, conducting if you think that this is something that's needed or, or desired, um, if you have sort of that basic uh, safety action plan, you can also apply for conducting supplemental action planning activities in support of an existing comprehensive safety action plan. So the action plan side is either about developing a safety action plan or supplementing the safety action plan work that you've done. An implementation grant is actually, of course, about implementing specific things, projects and strategies that can be a single project. Um, it can be sort of a set of project specific strategies uh, within a geographic area. Um, conducting planning and design, and you can conduct some supplemental action planning activities in support of an existing comprehensive safety action plan. So this is important, which is why it's in bold. An applicant for an implementation grant must already have established, must say that again, an applicant must already have established in place, you must already have um, an action plan in place to apply for an implementation grant. Activities must be tied directly to projects and strategies identified in your action plan. So for example, Dr. Cog, as you all know, um, has a regional taking action on regional vision zero plan. So we could apply for an implementation grant um, to implement something specific related um, to our regional vision zero plan as an example. Um, so for the action plan grants, the planning grants, eligible activities and costs include only those that directly assist in the development of the action plan or supplemental action plan activities in support of an existing action plan, um, a comprehensive safety plan. And at least 40% of the annual funding will be awarded for safety action plan grants and supplemental action plan activities. And so we list some examples around, you know, some example activities, uh, leadership commitment, goal setting, safety analysis, um, engagement um, or additional engagement or collaboration. And then under the supplemental planning uh, activities, some examples there, additional analysis and data collection, targeted equity assessments. Again, those are all kind of on the planning side of the shop. Under the implementation side for an implementation grant, eligible applicants must also meet at least one of the following conditions. Again, this is all from the NOFO, the Notice of Funding Opportunity, have ownership and or maintenance responsibilities over a roadway network be an eligible applicant with safety responsibilities that affect roadways, or have agreement from the agency that has ownership or maintenance responsibilities for the roadway within the applicant's jurisdiction. 
Also on an implementation grant, um, those implementation activities, projects and strategies, they must be infrastructure, behavioral or operational activities identified in the action plan upon which the implementation grant is based and must be directly related to addressing the safety problems identified in the application and in the applicant's um, action plan, this comprehensive safety plan. It also includes supplemental action plan activities in support of an existing action plan, as well as funding associated planning and design. Um, there's some examples listed there, I won't read through them, um, but again, in supporting an existing uh, comprehensive safety plan. So uh, that's all very confusing, a lot of information there, hard to summarize, but just to try and uh, draw back and show the big picture, action plan grants kind of a low barrier to entry. You know, so let's say you're a, you're a jurisdiction, you wanna do a comprehensive safety action plan, you wanna apply for an action, an action plan grant. So you're looking at safety impact, you're looking at equity, you're looking at safety considerations as part of that. For an implementation grant, again, you have to have an already approved comprehensive safety action plan because you're implementing a plan that you already have in place. Um, so it includes all the things that you see here um, on the right side of the screen, also project readiness, um, equity is a big uh, component of that as well. Um, this again comes from the NOFO, it's sort of a decision tree which, which grant is right for, for a particular community. Um, again, I think I'd summarize this by saying that for a typical local jurisdiction, you know, you all are doing some good safety work. Maybe you want to kind of formalize having a safety action plan, you would apply for an action grant. There's a few jurisdictions, Denver, Boulder, maybe one or two others where you have uh, potentially a comprehensive safety action plan. There is a checklist. Um, in the NOFO, there is a specific checklist that anyone applying for an implementation grant actually has to go through the checklist and certify um, that you have the required elements that's in the middle here. Does your existing action plan have the necessary elements? Three required elements and at least four out of six of the other elements that are listed in the checklist. And that's, that's a prerequisite to applying for an implementation grant um, related to your action plan. Um, there's a lot of FAQs. There is a specific website that I think we include in the memo. Um, USDOT has set up a website specific to um, the Safe Streets and Safe Streets and Roads for All grant program. Um, and there's some really helpful FAQs and a lot of good information on that website. Um, but this is important for this first year of funding, an eligible applicant will only be able to apply for an action plan or an implementation grant, but not both. That's a specific FAQ that has come up. So that's part of the conversation I want us to get into is about being strategic. What do we wanna apply for in this region? An eligible applicant may submit only one application to the funding opportunity. And as noted, a joint application, which again is comprised of a multi-jurisdictional group of entities that's regional in scope and an individual and an individual and an individual application, which is really easy for me to say, would count as two separate applications. So I think we're getting in the home stretch here, just some important dates we all need to keep in mind. Um, this isn't due until September 15th. It's an unusually long lead time and that's on purpose because as you've seen in this presentation, it's really about partnership, coalition, coalition building, thoughtfulness in terms of what we apply for. And USDOT wanted to give regions time to think through this together and put something compelling together. So it's due on September 15th, but August 15th is the last day that we can all submit questions to USDOT um, on this grant program. And then award announcements as indicated are expected to be made uh, by the end of either the calendar, end of the calendar year of 2022 or early into 2023. Um, so there's some resources that we include here um, and are also included in the memo. Um, lots of information, as I've said, associated with this, not just on the kind of homepage that USDOT has created, but we've also provided some information um, to kind of help people get their arms around this and um, doing the certification on the action plan, the FAQs, uh, et cetera, associated with this. So um, that's the end of the presentation. I guess let me kind of frame this conversation by saying, I think part of what we're looking for, we wanted to orient you, kind of get our arms around this together, but I think we'd be interested in some conversation around jurisdictions that may be interested in an individual grant application for a comprehensive safety action plan. But we also wanna start having some regional conversation around um, a potential regional coalition to apply for one or more implementation grants. So let me leave it there and let me open it up for group conversation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. See if anyone uh, has any questions here. 
Let me ask you a question, Jacob. Um, I think I know the answer to this, but I'll ask, uh, since we've all participated in the Dr. Cog Vision Zero plan, there was public engagement in all of our jurisdictions. Uh, I'm, I think the answer is no, but I'll ask anyway. Could, could we use the Dr. Cog Vision Zero Action Plan as our local action Vision Zero Action Plan to justify an application? Yeah, the, you're correct. The answer is no, as we understand okay. it. Now, to be clear, our Regional Vision Zero Action Plan was set up that a jurisdiction could take that plan or elements of that plan. You could customize it. It was built that way to be customizable, and you could take that plan or elements of that plan and adopt it as a jurisdiction. But the point of your question is that whether you do it that way or whether you have your own plan, you have to actually adopt something. You have to have a plan in place that you've prepared and adopted in some way to, to be eligible in that scenario. However, I guess let me add yep. to that, to be clear, that's why we want to think about a regional coalition for project implementation grant because we can, you know, Dr. Cog is, is either an applicant or, or partner to an application. Uh, we can use the Regional Vision Zero Plan if we're structuring an implementation grant around implementing something related to the Regional Vision Zero Plan. Thank you. All right, Matt Callison, you're up. Thank you, Steve. Uh, appreciate that, Jacob, in terms of the regional you know, uh, coalition potentially for action uh, uh, initiatives uh, on that. On going back to the action plans, safety action plan components, is there uh, a, a possibility of having multiple jurisdictions partner and go in for a, a development of a safety action plan? I'm going to say that I'm not completely sure on that. I think the intent is structured such that um, an individual jurisdiction would apply for an individual sort of, you know, say city of Aurora action plan, right? Um, but I, I don't know for sure, but I think I've, I'd ask back to you, Mac, what's the intent of your question in the sense that um, are you intending that several jurisdictions would get together to do a multi-jurisdictional plan? And if so, um, isn't that the intent of our regional vision zero action plan for the region? Can you can you amplify a little bit? Right. Well, the uh, point being, uh, economies of scale and agglomeration. Uh, if if two, if if two or more cities went in, or a city, um, or a combination of cities on that, um, uh, potentially. Uh, and it would still have to have the specificity. I'm, I'm surmising that uh, the USDOT is looking at uh, a fairly high detail level of specificity on these action safety plans that would then lead into uh, implementation uh, uh, projects and, and, and programs on that. Yeah, that part's correct for sure. Yeah, mm -hmm. so I think if your point is the jurisdictions team up that at the end of the day, you'd probably all adopt your own action plans, but could you work together, you know, economy of scale, maybe you hire a consultant, you all use the same consultant, you do things together, economy of scale to get those plans done. Is that the, is that the intent of your question? Correct. Correct. Okay. I'm going to confess, I don't know for sure. So I don't want to, I don't want to opine on that. Yeah. I don't know if that's an option or not. Okay. Any thoughts, Ron, on that from a local perspective? You know, Mac, um, I, I don't have any more information than than Jacob. I, you know, I, I think that's um, a, something to ask USDOT about and how they might approach that. I think it's an it's an interesting idea. A group of local jurisdictions that don't currently have Vision Zero plans or um, these action plans and sort of joining forces to help develop action plans that then you know, would result in individual action plans adopted by each jurisdiction. I think that's an interesting idea um, because I think, I think Jacob's first answer is, is also correct that the way the NOFO is structured that, you know, while we could, we, we think our vision, our vision zero plan combined with other planning efforts we've done um, meet the definition of the US of the action plan. And therefore we could do a regional coalition uh, uh, for a regional um, implementation project or set of projects under that, that um, an individual jurisdiction couldn't apply individually for an implementation project and use the regional vision zero plan as sort of the, the action plan for their jurisdiction. So uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, f uh, follow up question then: What constitutes uh, adoption or endorsement by the by the let's say in this case a, a city, a jurisdiction, yeah. uh, a resolution as such of council? Uh, what are the are the mechanisms that are cited to to satisfy that? I'd yeah, Mac. I... Go ahead, Jason. Oh. Well, actually, I'm not sure I have the answer. All I was going to say was that I have to go back and look at the NOFO, but I think the NOFO is relatively specific around what USDOT considers sort of a locally adopted action plan. Okay. And so well, we can, we can would, check on that. I would look at that self-certification thing that really kind of lays out sort of the requirements um, that they're looking for, the demonstration that uh, the action plan actually does exist. And it can, again, it doesn't have to be one plan document. It can be uh, sort of, you know, several documents that sort of that all meet different aspects of those requirements. But, um, you know, I think the key one is, it, I don't think it's, I don't recall it being specific that, you know, the council has to have adopted it by resolution, but they would have had to take some action to adopt it, whatever that local jurisdiction's action was. But I would think it would be some positive vote of the governing body of the jurisdiction, right? And it is a, it is a, an affirmation of adopting a, a vision zero um, strategy. Okay, thank you. Appreciate that, gentlemen. Thanks, Mac. Next, uh, Frank Bruno. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what I want to say about it, other than I'm I'm a believer in the vision zero concept and program. I've watched it in in Boulder unfold. Um, I guess I have a cautionary words of caution that, you know, having the plan and rolling out the plan with signage is, is a step, but I found what I found in my own community here is that very few people understand what it means. Um, you know, the signs that say vision zero 20, um, and, and fewer still comply, you know, with it. And I find myself very often, going down the street and, and using my, my rights to, even during the day, try to get, highlight that when someone is riding, riding me, getting very angry behind me. So I, I think I would just, you know, it's just a practical caution that having a plan, rolling out plan, having jurisdictions adopt, it's all great, but there's gotta be follow-up. And one example is we have a frontage road along US 36 here in South Boulder, where I live. And it's a very wide street and there are a few vision zero signs. And yeah, I think that probably the, my, my uh, informal uh, assessment is it's probably a 35, 40 mile an hour speed zone because it parallels the highway. It's the pathway through the neighborhood to the highway. So I think there's gotta be more commitment to implementation for vision zero, whatever that means. And I know that maybe falls to local jurisdictions in terms of speed bumps, <laughs> something maybe everyone is not in favor of, but, but it, you know, there's gotta be more to it. Otherwise it's just, it's just a metal sign that, that um, is, is not getting very far if the intent is safe streets. So maybe it's more of an editorial comment. Certainly, you know, I, I don't expect a a response to that, but it's just sharing a frustration maybe more than anything. But thank you for listening. Yeah, Frank, I you know really appreciate your comments and, and perspective. Um, what I'll say in response, you know, none of us have the magic answer. And I think you're you've really said it very eloquently. You know, one of the hardest things that we do is changing human behavior, right? Or trying to change human behavior or influence it in a positive way. Um, and the implementation of Vision Zero plans or any of our plans, you know, the devil was always in the details. Um, and that's something that we're cognizant of. And I know that um, all of you as local jurisdictions are cognizant of as well. And I think to relate it back specific to this conversation, that's why as, at Dr. Cog, we're interested in potentially applying or at least partnering on, you know, sort of a project implementation, um, you know, submitting a project implementation uh, application, because we do want to make progress. We do want to do, as we all do, right? Uh, we do we do want to do specific things that will um, help safety outcomes in this region. So yeah, part of this grant is good planning um, and encouraging good safety planning at the local government level. Part of this is when you have that regional planning, local and regional planning in place, let's find things to implement to start making a difference. So thank you for that. 
All right, Brian Weimer, you're up. Uh, yeah, to follow up on Mac's question, I think where he was leading is the county has an overall safety plan um, that we use data to come up with um, identifying where problem areas are and also the uh, cost benefit of various types of improvements as well as looking at improvements uh, to mitigate those safety issues. So that's portion of it, but we don't have maybe some of the other elements that the action plan is coming up with that if you truly want to be in compliance, we would have to go through that. So, and, but it is a countywide plan that includes all the various jurisdictions within the county. And that's kind of what was looked at. So I think that's where potentially Mac was coming from. And it sounds like if we went through something like that, that each individual jurisdiction would have to adopt it as opposed to just the county adopting. So that's our understanding, Brian. Yes. Okay. Um, the, the, the other question that I had was, um, you know, when you talk about partnering, are you looking at this being kind of a safety program? And when I say safety program, it would include multiple, maybe it includes multiple projects throughout the um, Dr. Cog area. So it would be, you know, trying to accomplish some goal, whatever that might be. So it could be a number of projects as opposed to individual submittals. Is that kind of what you're thinking of? I think so, Ryan. Let me kind of restate that in my own words and see if we're on the same page. I think we've got a couple options from the implementation. So specifically, you know, if a coalition is going to apply for an implementation uh, grant application, I think we've got a couple options. One is that um, we could apply for, I'll call it, say, a signature project in a specific location just to make something up, let's say federal. We've identified a stretch of federal, a location on federal. We want to do something impactful. Like That's one option, right? Another option, as we understand it through the NOFO, is we could apply for a set of strategies. And I don't want to make up examples, but you know something that isn't tied necessarily to a specific location, something that we could we could try through, you know, throughout the region or in a, in a you know the particular geography of the region, whatever it may be. But part of it could be several strategies in several locations that together, um, you know, we integrate together into quote unquote a safety project or a safety strategy project. We believe that both of those types of approaches are potentially allowable under the implementation grant portion of this does that yeah that is does, does your question yeah okay. i think it i mean it, that's where i was going with that and so okay yeah all right thank you next uh jean jean sanson hi thanks yeah jean sanson with the city of boulder um so i appreciate this agenda item being brought to the TAC. um and it sounds like related to what you were just sharing about the idea of a regional coalition for an implementation grant. If you're trying to gauge interest, I would say that the city of Boulder would be very interested in exploring something like this, um, particularly the idea of applying for a set of strategies. Um, so for example, if you take um, the Dr. Cog Vision Zero plan and um, you know, look at the high injury network, identify where the problems are occurring, and then start to apply the specific countermeasures identified in that plan to locations throughout the region. I think that starts to, to make a lot of sense, but to the point where they're not necessarily tied to specific locations, I'm just curious how that would work in terms of meeting the eligibility criteria, or not the eligibility, eligibility criteria, excuse me, but the scoring criteria um, for the grants, given that safety is probably the largest criteria. Um, so those would just be some questions, um, also questions about how, um, how we would participate in terms of providing local match, um, so again, I know there's probably a lot of conversation to be had, um, but generally speaking, I just wanted to share that, um, you know, if you're looking to convene a group or a subgroup of this TAC to continue this conversation, engage interest, we'd very much like to be at the table. Yeah, I appreciate that, Jean. Thank you very much. This is uh, Steve. I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, ask a question or make a statement, I guess, uh, uh, kind of going along Jean's uh, thoughts. Um, at Jefferson County, we've thought that maybe this would be a good opportunity to do some sort of region-wide motorcycle safety uh, program or strategy. Um, you know, there are guardrails 
specific to um, trying to reduce specific kind of injuries to, to motorcyclists. We do have a lot of motorcycle fatalities, uh, probably more uh, than most jurisdictions do in unincorporated Jefferson County. And I'm guessing that Boulder County and, and uh, Douglas County may be in the same boat with the foothills being right there. Uh, so that's another idea that we've been kind of playing with, uh, but not really uh, have anything specific on yet. But you know, that, that's, I guess, another example of how you might uh, apply a strategy approach instead of a project approach. Yep. Um, so I have a suggestion, Mr. Chair, but I want to wait to make sure that we've answered um, questions or responded to comments. Okay. I don't see any other hands in the air. So why don't you go ahead, Jacob? Okay. What I'm going to suggest is um, for all of you here and, and your other local government partners, if you could email me and Emily Kleinfelter, and our emails are on the um, on the items in the in the packet. If you could email us with your jurisdiction's interest in either an action plan grant or an implementation plan grant. Again, we're not asking you to commit to something, but just if you're interested in one or the other or both, could you start communicating with us? Let's, let's, start, let's start building sort of that universe. And I think Emily, I know, has already reached out to some of you anyway, but if you could sort of indicate that interest to us and interest of your partners, let's start getting that information and we'll start working together to kind of figure out a regional strategy because like any federal grant, especially discretionary grant, this is gonna be super competitive. Um, and so I think there is some allowance as we understand the NOFO that, you know, some of you can apply for sort of individual action plan grants or we can look into the concept of partnership action plan grants. And then we wanna come up with a really cool concept for an implementation or regional implementation grant. So let's, let's work together as a region because we're gonna to need to because it's gonna be so competitive. So if you all could start reaching out to me and Emily and then we'll start working with folks to uh, kind of further this conversation. And this probably won't be the last time we talk about it attack as well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Jacob, Brian, do you want to say something more? Yeah, just just one thing, um, Mr. Chair. And um, I want to thank Jacob and Emily for um, doing all the detailed research on this. Um, uh, you know, our interest is just making sure that the region is successful. Um, you know, we have we have the opportunity to bring up to one hundred and fifty million dollars into the state of Colorado uh, from this year's grant cycle for the Safe Streets and Roads for All program and. We just, you know, we don't want to get in anyone's way for any jurisdictions that have a qualifying action plan already and can can successfully complete that self-certification worksheet um, and feel like they have a good, compelling and competitive implementation grant request to go after, um, you know, and, and those applications can be up for up to $30 million. But for those jurisdictions that don't, and, you know, there may be some opportunity to pursue a regional strategy under Dr. Cog's regional visit zero plan, um, you know, we can apply up to $50 million for up to $50 million for um, a multi-jurisdictional uh, regional request. And so, you know, we would want to do that thoughtfully. We want to do it with some partners that are interested, but our, our goal really is to maximize the resources that come into this region and into the state of Colorado to address this really important issue, which is safety. Thank you, Ron. Jean, did you, uh, Jean Sanson, did you have something else you wanted to say? Yeah, I'm sorry. I know we're trying to move on, but real quickly, um, just two points of clarification. So Ron, thank you for that. Um, and I would say um, just, you know, based on where we are, just introducing this, this idea to the TAC, um, having an understanding from Dr. Cog as to, you know, what your timeline is going to look like related to, you know, exploring this idea, developing an idea and, you know, deciding whether this is a go or, or no go um, on the regional front is gonna be important for those individual jurisdictions who would be um, you know, interested in applying something or applying you know, on their own if, it, if it's not a go um, at the regional level. So that's one thing, just understanding the timeframe. And then just a question of clarification. I'm not sure I know the answer to, well, I thought I knew the answer to this, but now I'm questioning it. So um, if we like say, the city of Boulder, or Denver, or Jefferson County, or whomever participated in a regional implementation grant. Does that mean that we are joint applicants and then that precludes any of those individual jurisdictions from also pursuing um, a grant specific to their jurisdiction? Well, um, we are, we're trying to get more clarification from USDOT on exactly the parameters about that. Um, and. Um, well, how, Ron, how, we've got a we've got a little bit of clarification. Yeah, not final definitive clarification. We've got some ideas, and we're trying to run every we're trying to run all those issues down to, to ground. 
Go so ahead. let me, yeah, sorry, Ron, didn't mean to interrupt you, but let me just try and respond to that with what we know so far. Um, based on, the, and this is on the FAQs on the SS4A um, webpage. Uh, so I'm just going to read from this. Can I apply for multiple awards if I apply individually and as part of a joint application? No. An eligible applicant may submit only one application to the funding opportunity. A joint application, which is comprised of a multi-jurisdictional group, blah, 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 um, and an individual application would count as two separate applications. So that's a little confusing still, and I think we need to research a little bit more, but that's why I said we want to be thoughtful as a region, and Gene, your point about kind of the timeframes is, is well taken. We need to work this out pretty quickly, but we want to be thoughtful, A, so we don't disadvantage an individual community who's got something in mind, and B, so that we can be compelling as a region to, to be successful in this grant program. Great, Jacob, thanks, that's very helpful. Um, and just to reiterate, I mean, I think we do think that a regional application would be, you know, the strongest way to move forward with something like this, given how competitive and, and national in scope this is. So thank you. Okay. So the next item, if we're ready to move on, uh, is the tax guidelines update, item number seven on your agenda. Matthew Helfand. Hi, good afternoon. I am just setting it up now. All right, can everyone see that on the screen? Yes, we can. Good, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, so just some background, uh, the, the, the role of the TAC as stated in the guidelines is, is shown here, uh, assisting the Dr. Cog board and RTC by reviewing the work of the transportation planning process. Uh, we've done a lot of that this afternoon. Um, advising on methods of planning and implementation, working with the MPO staff to develop policy options and making recommendations to the RTC. So um, the, the TAC guidelines have not been updated in several years and today's discussion will focus around three general topics, agency membership, special interest seats and the appointment process. So um, staff have included uh, information in, uh, in your packets about uh, peer MPOs and um, some observations about differences and, si and similarities among them include uh, the number of seats for cities and counties varies and is often based on population. Uh, uh, representatives typic are, are typically chosen by the entities they represent, although sometimes it's uh, designated as a specific uh, position or title in the bylaws. Uh, state DOTs and federal agencies are always included, as far as we can tell, uh, in, in, in the equivalence of, of tax uh, amongst our peers, uh, but sometimes they have a vote and sometimes they're ex officio. Um, other entities that are that are sometimes represented, including uh, include uh, school districts, airports, um, health departments, tribal governments, and toll authorities. And just as an aside, uh, just kind of funny thing, um, the uh, the Metro Plan Orlando actually includes Disney World as, as one of their members, so it's kind of neat. Um, sometimes other MPO committees are represented as well. So. Staff have come up with general topics to start our conversation, and I will pause after each suggested uh, discussion top, uh, topic for questions and comments. Uh, so uh, discuss, discussion topic number one, uh, jurisdictional representation could be selected by the sub-regional forums. Uh, sub-regional forums already perform vital tasks by recommending projects for inclusion in our RTP and our TIP. Perhaps uh, this could be uh, another important job for them and I'll, I'll, I'll pause now. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, if I could, just a little bit of context on that idea to frame the conversation. Um, so in our committee guidelines currently, it's actually the board chair who directly appoints the local government members based on recommendation from staff. So anytime we have a local government vacancy, um, I take that to our board chair, um, a recommended candidate and the board chair actually directly makes that appointment. The way I've been doing that for the last several years is actually to go to the county transportation forums and ask you all, can you work together to come up with a consensus candidate um, to fill a seat? So this is really about the idea here, the concept is should we just formalize kind of what we've already been doing in practice the last two to three years or so? Thank you. 
Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Mr. Chair, it looks like Brian Weimer has his hand raised. So with this, I'm, I'm sorry, I had my I had my mic I muted. I didn't I didn't mean to. Go ahead, Brian. Yeah. So with this proposal, are you still saying that um, the board chair would make the actual appointment, or are you just saying that whatever is recommended from the sub region would be the um, member? Brian, we're suggesting that the, oh, sorry, Matthew. No, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. No, Brian, so we're, this concept, and again, we're concepts for conversation. We're not, as staff sort of dictating things, but the concept here would be, yes, the forum, the forum directly would, um, the forum would vote and make that appointment, not the board chair. Okay, thank you, because I know we've made recommendations and it's formalized with the board chair, so that's really the change, I guess. And, and just one more thing to add to, to Jacob's comment. I was going to say that I wouldn't call these proposals. We, we're calling them discussion topics. And certainly, we're open to um, other discussion topics uh, if, um, if others come uh, from you guys today. So uh, these are just topics that we thought of uh, to discuss. I wouldn't characterize them uh, as strongly as proposals. And are, is there something that you're trying to address with these changes? Um, or is, you know, what really, what is the, I guess, the overall purpose with proposing changes? So, so we're not proposing changes as much as we just, as staff, got together internally and discussed uh, potential um, uh, topics to discuss uh, uh, amongst our TAC. Uh, just to get the conversation started. And so um, we came up with a few of them and I'm gonna, I'm gonna go through them today, uh, but um, I, wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't characterize them as proposals. But ultimately, uh, our, the, the TAC guidelines haven't been um, amended in, in quite a while. And so we thought it was a, a good time to, to revisit and, and, and see if there's any um, updates that, that, that make sense to make. Yeah, and Brian and everyone, I would just add to that. I think Matthew's, Matthew's right, especially the last thing he said. It's not just updating the TAC guidelines just for the sake of updating them, but it is the notion that it has been several years and we've tried to be thoughtful as staff of thinking about, you know, how well is this working and could it work even better? And I would characterize as the person who sort of administers this committee, I would say that, yeah, things are working well. It's not that there's like a, a terrible problem we're trying to solve, but we are trying to be thoughtful about the fact that as the region continues to evolve and how we work together and how we do things and what's important, is there an, an opportunity and appetite for, you know, process improvement to make this even better? And I think the forums is one example. You know, again, I already go to the forums directly when, when there's a vacancy, should we formalize that kind of thing? So I think it's more a thoughtfulness of, of can we do even better um, is, is it worth, you know, making some changes or considering some ideas uh, for a conversation that we just haven't had in several years? Ed Mormon, did you want to add to this conversation? Uh, yeah, just a question as you look at this, um, and I don't object to sub-regional forms. That's what, what traditionally has happened. We've made recommendations and then the, you've taken it to the chair. But the other question I have is, will there be some guidelines on, you know, will it be only the forms that are represented or will it be cities and towns within that form as well as the county? Um, what's your, what type of guidelines are you thinking about putting on that, that representation? So um, if I, if I recall back to the internal conversation we had a, as staff, um, jurisdictional could mean um, counties and or uh, cities, towns. Yeah, and just to add to that, Matthew, and I think this may be in your presentation. I don't want to give away your next point if it's your next point. But the idea would be here that um, there would be some, some minimum representation. We actually you know, have talked as, as a concept of expanding local government seats on TAC. Um, and so there'd be a certain, potentially a certain, again, concepts, but certain number of seats directly, um, and then the mechanism for filling a vacancy would be through the forum. So it'd be kind of doing yep. both things. 
Art Griffith. Well, I was anxious to get to the next slide, but then Jacob started talking about the numbers represented from the subregion form. So is that going to be covered later? Because then I'll hold my question. Yes, there, there'll be a, um, a, a form of that question later. Uh, also, um, you'll, you'll have opportunity to weigh in on any other comments or questions you may have. I'll wait, thanks. Thanks. All right, um, discussion topic two, unless, unless there were any other questions or comments. I don't think that there were. Okay. Go ahead. Because I'm looking at the presentation screen, so I don't see people raising their hand. Um, so uh, discussion topic two, uh, there could be a Denver, a Denver International Airport seat in lieu of an aviation interest seat. I'll say that it's been a challenge to maintain representation over the years from aviation interests other than Den. And there's also precedent uh, for MPOs reserving seats in their advisory committees for particular airports. So just wanted to get your thoughts on, on, on this topic. So well, it's George. I mean, I'd be biased to say we are fine with that, but I'll let others speak to it. I guess I'll, I'll contribute that since we have an airport in Jefferson County. Um, I don't know if there's been effort to try to include anyone from the Rocky Mountain Municipal uh, Airport as the aviation interest. And I don't know if that's something that would be desirable. I, I, I don't really have, besides representing Jefferson County, I don't have much of a thought about that. But uh, maybe you've tried and they've said, no, thank you. I don't know. Yeah, Steve, to your point, um, I'll admit, I don't remember precisely if we've reached out to Rocky Mountain Airport. What I can say is that uh, for a very long time, we had a uh, DEN representative. And then when the seat became open, and this was probably two or three or four years ago now, maybe two or three years ago, um, we did purposely try to seek out just, you know, somewhat an aviation interest besides Den, not that we don't love Den, but just to give some variety to the seat. Um, and we did have um, the general manager of the Centennial Airport um, holding the seat for a few months. Um, and then he asked to sign off. And then as you heard me say at the beginning of this meeting, we've also had David U. Lane, who's um, the head of the Division of Aeronautics at CDOT, who's held this seat for a while, um, who's also asked to sign off. And I think the issue there, the feedback I've gotten is that People appreciate what we do, it's important, but most of our surface transportation work is more around highways, roadways, transit, bike ped safety, et cetera. It's hard, you know, there isn't always an aviation hook necessarily, even though we, we do try to be thoughtful around that. It's hard for these folks to participate. It's hard to give time. Um, Den has just, you know, Den's a little bit more integrated um, in the overall work. We've talked about the Pena project today, for example. So it's, I think it's just, and Den has more staff resources. It's just been easier for Den to be um, that aviation partner rather than a smaller airport or another, another aviation interest. I think that's just the bottom line. Well, I didn't want to make my comments sound like I was preferring one or the other. I think that it's fine to have Den be that seat uh, for, for, what, for what it's worth. I'll call on Brian Weimer. Yeah, I think that um, an aviation interest is needed. Um, and that's a, a broader perspective than just Dan. So that would be my comment. If I may, it's George H. again from Dan. Um, I agree with Brian. It's, it's actually, you know, aviation is obviously much broader, not only for other airports in Colorado State, but also, you know, looking at um, airlines and big employers at the you know Den Airport and other airports. I mean, we are facing issues of you know providing uh, affordable transportation options, transit options for employees to get to the places like Den Airport where jobs are, and that's certainly part of you know the the broader regional you know Dr. Con uh, Dr. Co conversation. Okay, any more questions on this slide? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands, so uh, why don't we move on to the next one? All right, uh, discussion topic three. Uh, the Area Agency on Aging's Aging Advisory Committee 
could have a seat on TAC. Um, there's also precedent uh, for other uh, MPOs, uh, MPO committees to be represented based on, on the research we did of our peers. Uh, while the advisory committee is not an MPO committee, it, it does oversee Ameri uh, Older Americans Act funding, much of which uh, funds transportation. So happy to take any questions or, or comments on this one. Just while well, folks are thinking about like, questions. Uh, Oh, oh, sorry. Right. I was going to no, say go Brian ahead, Limer's got his hand up. Yeah. So, don't we have a senior interest already on the committee? And would this take the place of that, or are you thinking that it would be in combination thereof? Probably more in combination of, um, just because this particular committee oversees. Uh, funding from the um, Older Americans Act, and much of it goes to transportation. And the thought behind this is that we could better coordinate with, with the Area Agency on Aging and the MPO functions by including a seat to represent uh, that important committee. And should there be a quick pro quo that a TAC member be placed on the AAA um, committee? Um, that would certainly uh, that we, we haven't had specific discussions uh, with the area agency on aging on that particular topic, but we can certainly uh, uh, engage with the AAA and see what they what they think. Yeah, to be negotiated. That's an interesting idea. Yeah. Next is Frank Bruno. Thank you. I I, I think it makes sense to uh, to have someone on on the tech uh, I you know I know in everything that we do here at via we have our linkage with our local uh, AAA and and I know we do with with the dr. cog AAA so I, I think it makes all the sense in the world and I think we could probably do a lot a lot more coordination so yep I think so okay our Griffin Griffith sorry you know I support this but um I also think that it's a huge continuous collaboration that we need. And I kind of thought that we should rely on Dr. Cog to bring that aspect to not only the TAC, but to the Aryan agency. So, you know, I'm supportive of it, but I don't know if, um, if that means that, um, uh, that the Dr. Cog staff has lesser role of coordinating those issues. So that some I'm, I'm, I'm for it, but hopefully the whole point I'm trying to bring up is we need to have more collaboration with them through Dr. Cog staff. Yeah, and Art, I appreciate that point. I'd suggest it might even lead to more coordination. There is extensive coordination that Matthew and others do between our MPO uh, planning function, our transportation planning function, and our AAA already. Um, and that's already been increasing over the years, particularly with our um, integrated funding sources and those sorts of things. And I think this is sort of potentially the next evolution or one of the next pieces of evolution of that coordination. So your point's well taken. You know, just for example, the Lone Tree Link, you know, has um, outreach and a lot of their customers fit right in that um, category. And um, I think having an integrated system um, that serves many needs of the public is paramount. Well said. Hillary Simmons. Thank you. Yes, I'm actually currently in the um, senior special interest seat. And I think it would be great to have more representation for our older adults um, through the Area Agency on Aging having a seat on the TAC. Um, I just had a point of clarification. Would it, are, are you thinking this seat would be somebody who is a um, employee or a staff person through the Area Agency on Aging or is also on their um, committee that helps make grant decisions? Like, which, which role of person do you think would, would also join um, on the TAC? I think that's um, a great idea to, to bring more senior voices to the table. 
Um, and I like the idea of, you know, that cross piece as well, if we are able to have somebody who's on both. Thanks. Yeah, thank you for your question, Hillary. Um, the, the, the thought that staff have, but we're certainly open to, to other suggestions, uh, was that um, someone from, from the committee that oversees the Area Agency on Aging, uh, which is made up of not staff, but separate members of the community, uh, would, would be a good fit. Um, we already have, uh, as Jacob uh, stated, um, some really good coordination among staff here at Dr. Cog. But we thought um, the, the having someone from that committee that oversees that funding uh, might make sense to include in, in, in an MPO committee. Steve, I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, there might be some voting that needs to um, have abstention when somebody's brought funding to this table that's already been approved there, that kind of thing. But otherwise, you know, again, I think more, more voices representing older adults uh, is great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I don't see any other hands. Uh, do you, would you wanna move on to the next? Sure. Uh, so uh, discussion topic four, uh, there could be a special interest, uh, could be special interest seats representing the most vulnerable users from a safety perspective, such as bicycle riders and pedestrians. Uh, there's currently a, a, a seat for transportation demand management slash non-motorized transportation interests. Uh, but perhaps we could keep a, set, uh, a seat dedicated for TDM and have separate seats for bicycle riders and pedestrians since those users have different needs. Rachel Halton. Great, thank you. Um, well, as a representative from Bicycle Colorado, who's the alt representative on the TDM non-motorized, uh, I obviously clearly support this. I think there is a different perspective in terms of you know, the, the technical sides of transportation planning and funding that is pretty distinct for vulnerable road users, bicyclists and pedestrians, um, that's definitely different from TDM. So I would enthusiastically support um, creating a position for, for this particular demographic. And Mormon. I, I would also agree uh, with Rachel on there that those are really two different, well related, they're, they're different. And um, with having had both on, on the TAC before at different times, they do bring separate uh, perspectives. So a follow-up question on the um, comments we just received. Um, we're, staff were thinking maybe one seat specifically for bicycle riders and, one, and another for pedestrians, or are you thinking one for, for both? Anyone like to respond to that one? Rachel? Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would actually say you could have one for both. I mean, I'll say my job at Bicycle Colorado, I spend as much time talking about uh, pedestrian infrastructure and investments as I do bicycle. And I think most anyone who's working in, in active transportation is really pretty fluent with, with both. So, um, I mean, as much as I'd love to have two, you know, we, we don't want, you know, 75 people on the tech either. So I think you could get away with just one um, unless somebody else feels really strongly. I think, I think most of us are pretty fluent in both. Kent? Thank you. Um, yeah, the biggest one I see on pedestrians is, is uh, first of all, are you wanting like wheelchair handicap or are you wanting regular pedestrians? But just finding those folks may to be a representative may be tough where you already have, um, like Rachel said, they're pretty fluent in both uh, uh, items. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, just a slight bit of framing on this, because uh, this could go a couple different directions. And this goes back to sort of the why. Um, one of the quirks in our committee guidelines is that in our seven special interest seats, one of them is the shared seat between, you know, transportation demand management and non-motorized. And we have informally, although this isn't in our committee guidelines, we've informally rotated this seat every couple of years, right? 
so one thought is, you know, first of all, let's, you know, let's have one seat for each. And that's part of what um, is encapsulated in Matthew's discussion topic here. Let's have a TDM seat. Let's have a non-motorized seat. But I think the other perspective this could take is given the importance of safety to all of us, you know, does that, and particularly vulnerable users from a safety perspective, does the non-motorized seat, if we, if we agree to splitting it out between TDM and non-motorized, does the non-motorized seat also represent kind of those safety interests or, you know, do we have a TDM seat and non-motorized seat and, you know, is it worth having sort of a quote unquote safety seat per se? So we don't have to decide that today, but those are dimensions of what, what we're thinking about here and what Matthew's presenting. Okay, why don't we move on to the next topic? All right, uh, discussion topic five. Um, and, and this is one I believe Art was bringing up. Um, agency seats uh, could be selected by the agencies they represent instead of the Dr. Cog board chair. Uh, there, there's, there's, um, there's precedent uh, for this in, um, in the research we did about our, our peer MPOs. Matthew, could you expand a little bit on this, just the oh. initial sort of what we were kind of thinking about? Yes. Uh, so um, uh, currently, uh, they're, they're, they're the agency seats being more like um, not the jurisdictional seats, but the other types of agencies, um, uh, they, uh, th their, um, their member is, is technically selected by the Dr. Cog board chair. Perhaps based on the precedents that we've seen, uh, it makes more sense to either, uh, and because and some of the agencies do, as uh, some of the MPOs do it this way, of um, having a specific position, or just allowing the, the, the representing agency to select their members. And could you give an example of agencies if they're not RTD and CDOT? Uh, those are those are agencies we're we're thinking of here. Art, uh, <clears throat> Matthew, I think we're just talking about other local agencies, right? Like, um, or are you thinking of different agencies? Um, within Douglas County, like, um, I'm, I'm a little confused. I, my question is going to be more related to um, increasing the number of participants in the TAC um, by other local agencies. So maybe I'll just sneak in my idea right now. Um, sure. I think, go go I think for it, Art. Yeah, I think all the counties should be represented, but um, we're getting more and more interest from the elected officials in Douglas County to have more of, of their technical representatives at the TAC. So um, I was thinking that there might be a, an opportunity to increase um, the number of those representatives in the TAC from the local agencies. Yeah, our, we're thinking the same way. So just, just to be clear, and again, this is sort of a convoluted piece of our existing committee guidelines. The board chair appoints, directly appoints the 13 local government members. And that's a little bit, there's nothing wrong with that. We love our board chairs, that's not the issue. The issue is that that's a little bit quirky in terms of local government representation on a transportation advisory committee. So I think our initial sort of idea would be that first of all, those would be appointed either by say the counties, for example, might appoint their own representatives. The forum would appoint the local government representatives where we could talk about whether the forum appoints all of them, but more directly appointed by the local governments themselves instead of the board chair. And then secondly, to your point, Art, expanding local government representation on TAC by having um, because right now we have two representatives per county for the most part, but again, it gets a little bit convoluted. We have small communities. It, it's a little quirky um, the way it's in our existing committee guidelines. So the idea would be something like, you know, maybe there's one or two from each county just, you know, sort of by right. And then maybe there's making up a number three, um, more local governments that the forums would appoint. We could talk about numbers, but the point is both to expand the local government membership from, from each county on TAC, make it more inclusive and 
to have the local governments slash the forums in some ways appoint those members directly, not the board and, chair. And, and that's exactly what I would um, hope that we consider further. I think that's a great idea. I still think that the subregions can make those recommendations, but I don't have a problem with the Dr. Cog board or the Dr. Bo Cog board chair, you know, um, reviewing and approving that. I mean, um, I, I think that I don't want to say it's a slam dunk from the, the sub regions, but um, I think some oversight from the Dr. Cog board of blessing the final list is appropriate. Don't see any other hands in the air in this one. All right, I will move on to the final one. Um, RTD could have more seats to match uh, CDOT. Uh, so RTD currently has one seat while CDOT has three. Um, and just some thoughts on, on this, like RTD provides mobility for many who don't have access to cars or, or cannot drive and has an annual budget that's comparable to CDOT's. So just some thoughts uh, from staff uh, to start conversation. Ryan Weber. Um, my question is, since we don't know the final governance of RTD, how, do, how would the service councils, uh, if those move forward, fit into this? Um, I, your guess is as good as ours, uh, because we could, uh, we could be flexible with, the, with interpretations here. And this is just a, you know, a first thought. So um, I, that's certainly possible and worth discussing a little bit more and I, I I see I see Bill um is on so from RTD so he might have more to say on this hey go ahead Bill so the the concept with the service councils is, is again it's going to be made up of you know folks from the jurisdictions as well as other interests that are not that represent RTD writers so there could be people that are and, and they're all going to be from the same kind of I'll just say pool of people. Um, so I, I would, one thing I would say is that it, it may be very similar as many of you have particip did participate in the work group. So my assumption is that you will be participating in the service council. So just a little bit on that, that's how it is. And, and just to comment generally on this, I think RTD is certainly open to this. I, I'm not gonna tie in my sword and say, we need more seats. Um, we, we could get, the, the option that we could get is somebody with more of an operational perspective to be involved that might be interesting and might be per, per, bring a different perspective, I think, than um, me being the, the planner guy. Yeah, and Mr. Chair, I think, you know, again, we're open to open to conversation. I think the initial thought here is this is staff oriented. So to be clear, CDOT currently has four seats on TAC and we love all of our CDOT representatives, not a negative reflection on CDOT, but CDOT has four staff on TAC, RTD has one. Through our federal MPO planning requirements, what we call the 3C planning process, we are a joint partnership between Dr. Cog, CDOT and RTD. So I think the thought here is the question is, you know, given Dr. Cog seats on TAC, given CDOT seats on, on TAC, um, should, in fairness, RTD have more probably staff seats on, on TAC or not? I guess one thing to consider with that is RTD or CDOT is representing um, multiple regions too. So that could be part of it where, um, you know, RTD is one, certainly it's great, but they're not split into those various areas. So I suspect that's some of the reason for that. That is some of the reason, yes. We have a region one, a region four representative on TAC, um, and then from headquarters, the Division of Transportation Development and the Division of Transit and Rail, um, all, all of which are super important and, and glad that they're all here. But yes, you're right. That's partly why we have four, uh, four CDOT folks. Griffin? Yeah, um, it kind of begs the question, should we have more 
uh, TMAs on the TAC to, if we go this route with RTD, you know, it seems like, I think in the future, TMAs are gonna have a more and more important role in first and half miles and micro mobility and other things like that. So, um, you know, I, I think Brian's point's well taken. I think representing bigger CDOT for multiple um, regions. Um, we still are in region two in Deckers, but it's, I don't know if we consider that part of the Dr. Fogg area. It's right on the cusp of leaving a <laughs> county. But um, so I, I guess my point is, is um, I think we should all collaborate with RTD and we do that at the sub-regional levels. Um, so I, I think if we add more RTD reps, I kind of like feel maybe there should be a rep for, for each TMA. Okay, any more thoughts on this one? I'm not seeing any hands. We can move on to the next slide. Oh, I forgot there was one more. If I, if I accidentally said that the, the last one was final, this is the final one. Um, so uh, Via Mobility could have its own seat in lieu of a seat for non-RTD uh, representative of transit interests. Um, VIA is the largest human service transportation provider and second largest transit provider in the Dr. Cog region. Uh, a non-RTD representative of transit interests is, is currently uh, represented by uh, Frank Bruno of, of um, VIA Mobility. So just some thoughts there. Questions or comments? Doesn't look like we have any. And Mr. Chair, while folks are thinking about it, kind of the context and the framing here is that not so much that we're advocating either for DEN or for VIA, it's more we're trying to be thoughtful as staff around our seven, our current seven special interest seats. Should those seats, you know, they represent subject matter experts related to transportation, right? And should those seats in some cases be particular agencies or should they be more um, kind of open? So again, it's not that we're advocating for a couple of particular agencies, it's more um, big picture. What's the right fit for a particular seat of the subject matter expertise we're trying to, uh, we're trying to have on that seat for TAC? Okay, Brian Weimer. My personal opinion is that it should be more open and it could be representative because you may have different um, representatives in the future and leave that flexibility. And it, it could be via in the future, could be Dan, but let's not make it specific, personal opinion. All right, I'm not seeing any other comments or on this one. All right, well, thank you. Um, are there any other comments or questions on this subject not, uh, not related to the discussion topics we just had that you'd like to bring up? Hey, Matthew, it's Cam. Um, in the chat, Wally Wirt mentioned cargo is also a consideration. So Wally, I don't know if you wanted to speak on uh, cargo's behalf or, um, but yeah, I just noticed you mentioned that in, in the comments. The only thing I would mention is that Denver International and as are all of the major airports, also cargo hubs, and they have a significant influence on movement, which of course is trucks. Uh, it ties into all of the air quality issues. So you can't overlook the cargo developments that surround an airport, uh, the passenger, traffic is more automotive related and the cargo operations tend to lend themselves more to local delivery vehicles, which might ultimately be electric or some other method. So, so as far as an airport representative, it should be someone that's got a fair amount of cargo. And of course, DIA is the regional uh, airport. So just my thought. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I, I will just uh, to add to that point out that we do have a separate 
um, trans, uh, excuse me, freight uh, uh, special interest seat in addition uh, uh, to having aviation. Okay. Well, with that, I think we are wrapping up that item. Uh, Thank you. On. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to our administrative items. Uh, are there any member comments or other matters that anyone would like to cover today? Seeing none, uh, we'll, uh, so our next meeting will be July 25th and expect that to be in person unless uh, the COVID uh, situation remains uh, at the level it is now or something similar. So, but our, our base assumption is we're gonna meet in person whenever possible. So be prepared for that. And uh, that Mr. Chair, oh, it go. does look like we have a AMP work, uh, working group update on the agenda. Oh, I apologize. Yes, let's move on to AMP working group update. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, Carson was not able to be here today. Um, I know he mentioned he was gonna give that update to someone. Is someone still here in attendance that has the update to give? Okay, if not, Mr. Chair, we can we can just ask to, we can have that circulated just so folks have it. Okay, appreciate that. Oh, actually, I, sorry, Mr. Chair, um, Emily Lindsay uh, may be able to, to update. Um, she needs to be made a panelist, however, to do that. Hello, everybody, can you hear me? Yes, we yes, can, thank you, Emily. Awesome, I'm Emily Lindsay with Dr. Hogg. In lieu of Carson's update, I'll give you a quick update from the June AMP activities um, at the June 7th AMP working group, there was an AMP executive committee debrief where we talked about actions um, taken at the executive committee level, which included the approval of the regional mobility data platform concept. We also had two informational briefings, one from um, the city and county of Denver on their e-bike incentive program and one from RTD on reimagine RTD. We also had an update on system operations from Greg McKinnon at Dr. Cog on the Dr. Cog Regional Transportation Operations and Technology Strategic Plan. Um, because of the July 4th holiday, we will be canceling the July 5th meeting. So the next meeting of the AMP Working Group will be in August. Thanks. All right, thanks, Emily. All right, with that, again, we'll, our next meeting is July 25th, uh, 2022, and we will adjourn this meeting. Thank you all for attending this afternoon.